the mindset is always about how systemic power, therefore politics, are relevant to everything. So now it's how is politics relevant to knowledge? It's how do we make knowledge more of a political process instead of less of a political process? Hey, everybody. Welcome to another uh, video. This is um, going to be a fun one today. I've got James Lindsay here. Well, how's it going, James? Okay, here we are. Let's see what we can do with this. It's going good. Hiding out in pandemic. Yeah, how's it been going so far? Well, I cut my own hair last night, so my bingo card's going well. It hit like 85 degrees, and I pulled a total Pedro, and I was like (laughs) feeling very hot, and I thought it was because of my hair. It was definitely because of my hair, and Mm -hmm. so I cut my own hair last night, and it came out okay. Sweet. I'm getting to that point, too. It's, It's pretty bad. So today, I just wanted to get your feedback, get your just thoughts on these few videos that Anthony Magnabosco released over the past few weeks. He uh, talked with this person months ago and got three interesting conversations, and I have them all lined up here today. This person seems pretty well into the critical social justice ideology, which you have been very thoroughly explaining in your new website, new discourses. Want to give background on your new website first? Sure. Yeah. So um, new discourses is this web platform that I'm building. That's It's got articles. It's got kind of educational type or informative, I guess, is better than educational resources on it. Some of it's audio, some of it's video, some of it, a lot of it's written. The goal of new discourses in the biggest picture is to kind of like cut across things that that limit our ability to have discourses or conversations or dialogue effectively. So if anybody's caught up in some kind of a sort of politicized cult, one side or the other or another than that, cutting across that and trying to get people to be able to understand what's going on and understand one another and talk is kind of the big picture goal. The smaller picture goal right now is that I have become an expert through no desire of my own in the uh, ideology and, and the scholarship of an activism of critical social justice, as I've called it, which most people would recognize under other names like the social justice movement, social justice warriors, uh, wokeness, uh, the woke movement, things like that. Jordan Peterson called postmodern neo-Marxism uh, kind of a mouthful. So I've become kind of an expert in this. And so I'm because I'm expert in that and because it is one of these things that's that's really tangling up our discourses and public conversations, I'm trying to explain that in as much detail as possible as my primary agenda right now so that people can better understand what it means. And I'm, I mean, I've watched these videos the other day and I think they're an awesome example. So I'm pretty excited to go through this with you. People have this sense that what, what I'm going to just keep calling critical social justice is, you know, well, it's some college students or it's some activists who have a few weird terms that they use, but it's really that they have a not just a completely different way of using the, say, English language. It could be whatever language, but whatever native language they speak, in our case, English. It's also that there's a mindset that kind of goes along with that use. It's a culture. It's it's a it's a way of of thinking that ties into these words and people don't understand it and think, oh, well, this person's just saying some crazy stuff or some weird stuff. And I don't even think that person knows what they mean. And but but the thing is, is it is a worldview like many others and, and within its own internal logic, people do understand what they mean and it can be made intelligible. And so because this social justice conversation is so important and so widespread right now and so pertinent in so many of our conversations, my primary goal with new discourse is to help people understand that this is a mindset, that this is a worldview. It can be understood. And when you understand it, uh, you can make your own decisions about it, but most people will not probably accept what they're seeing there when when they see what what it's really about. Yeah, after having read a lot of your articles on your website, you have this like encyclopedic ongoing project of explaining all of these terms and just hearing, watching these videos. And after reading that, there's just so much deeper stuff going on that people wouldn't have any idea about when, unless you actually like read your articles or just learn more about this. Right. Yeah. So new discourses I am building 
literally an encyclopedia of social justice terminology. So that would include some of this specialized academic language terms like epistemic friction and uh, epistemic oppression and privilege preserving epistemic pushback, shadow text, you know, really specialized technical terminology that they've come up with. But it also includes everyday words and concepts that people will think they understand what they mean when they hear them, but they actually have a very specialized usage. And that can include, I mean, most notably will include terms like racism and sexism, which are understood in a systemic way, not in the way that most of us think. White supremacy is also thought of in a similar way. And then also ideas like diversity, equity, and inclusion have very specific understandings. And these understandings, again, like you were kind of alluding to all kind of mesh together. And you see that there's a lot more going on under the surface than just the terms. So, so far to date, I've got about a hundred terms explained on there. And the way that I'm doing that is that I'm directly quoting from their literature and then explaining it in my own words. um, So you can understand that I'm not making it up. I'm not exaggerating the way that they actually use these words or or for example, the word engagement, you know, to properly engage uh, with something, you know, we all know what that means. We all have a sense of what proper academic or or any other kind of engagement is, but you can actually read in their literature that they mean that you haven't properly engaged with it unless you've done so from a perspective of critical theory. So unless you understand that when they say, oh, well, you're not engaging with my material, you wouldn't understand that engagement requires you to take on their worldview first. It would be as if, you know, a Christian were to come up and say, well, you haven't read the Bible as a Christian, therefore, of course, you disagree with it. Um, And you can kind of see where that uh, fundamentalist internal uh, circular logic comes in when you start getting into that. But if you don't understand that that's, that's how they think, then it seems much more reasonable than it is. Right. Yeah. So cool. Let's just jump right into it. And I'd love to just hear your feedback at any point in these. So here we go. Yeah, cool. I don't want to take a lot of your time. So I'll set the timer for four minutes. And again, the idea here is to, you know, not only pick a belief that you think is true, but motivate you to behave differently because you think that it's true. You know what I mean? Like you'll actually light sage in your apartment to ward off those evil spirits, that type of thing. What do you think we can explore together? Equity. 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 Or the illusion of equity. Before we go any further, I want to totally understand what your definition of equity is. You've seen this video before, but I'm sure I have. you can give your own definition. Maybe should we listen to hers first and then you can explore more? No, let's give let's give the real definition of, of equity before and then we'll see what she says. Um, so the equity that she's referring to probably, I mean, I know I've already seen the video, so I know that the form of equity that, that's relevant in critical social justice is what's known as uh, what's called um, social equity and social equity was a concept that started, I think, in the late 60s and really kind of got developed and concretized in the 80s. And in a paper that was pretty influential, that was directed toward and and influential in public policy in the early 80s, I think early 80s, maybe it was mid 80s, the the definition of equity is given very explicitly. The, the, The definition is very clearly given as uh in comparison to equality. So we understand equality means that citizen A and citizen B are equal and equity means that shares are adjusted so that citizen A and citizen B are made equal. So equity in its most simple incarnation under the the, the theory that operates with critical social justice is this idea that um, shares should be adjusted so that people are made equal. In other words, that we, we, we fool around with the system so that there's an equality of outcome. So when she said that she wants to talk about equity or rather the illusion of equity, what she's probably referring to is the fact that uh, there's a kind of dominant belief that we have equality or fairness in our society, but because we produce disparate outcomes uh, or disparate outcomes occur, I should say, then the, the, the claim that the equity is effective in society or equality exists in society is um, an illusion. And in fact, 
equality and equal opportunity uh, are are cast under the, the the net of critical social justice as illusions, as myths, as in fact ideologies that are promoted by the dominant and powerful classes, so that people who aren't getting equitable treatment um, are not aware that they're being screwed by the system. And so you can actually look at the way that they they try to measure equity and the way that they measure equity is if there's a difference in outcomes, then it must be that the system is inequitable. In other words, that there is some kind of discrimination or disenfranchisement at the center of the system. So, um, and they say that explicitly. In fact, when I was doing the research for the entry in uh, the Social Justice Encyclopedia for Health Equity, they say explicitly in article after article about health, health equity, which is equity applied to health, that the way that you can tell whether equity is being achieved is if outcomes are identical or not. And if the outcomes are identical, then you have equity. More complicated here with equity also is that there's going to be an idea of historical equity. So if a particular group of people say, uh, black people, if we wanted to do the way that they they do and they think about it, have been historically disenfranchised. That has to be made up for with some kind of um, social or economic or some other form of reparation. And equity can't possibly be achieved until that's done. So that's what she's talking about when she talks about equity. Wow. Let's see what she says. And then maybe we can get into your claim about it. I want to make sure that we're on the same page. Okay. Um, what does equity mean? Equity, I think we're going to have to pick something in relation to a specific something. So equity in relation to epistemic justice. Epistemic justice? Mm -hmm. What do you mean by epistemic justice? Okay, that was that's really weird um, because she doesn't really know what equity means in general. Uh, mm -hmm. but she has this vague sense. So you can see immediately that we're talking about a situation where um, there's a moral intuition around when something is equitable that doesn't even take into account what it specifically means because adjusting shares so that citizens are made equal is not a difficult definition to give if you actually understand what equity is. It's in fact a single sentence that's entirely comprehensible by pretty much anybody right away. Uh, so she wants to talk about it in terms of something specific and rather than pulling up something that would have been pretty easy to pull up, um, like affirmative action, which was an equity program, <laughs> uh, she pulls up this idea of epistemic justice. So the, the steeping in the theory here is pretty deep. And that's where, by the way, epistemic justice, that's what I'm talking about where I said in the encyclopedia, I'm trying to make entries for these very specific terms. There's an entry. I don't have an, entry in the encyclopedia for epistemic justice. I do have one, however, that is currently active for epistemic injustice, which is a concept that's been pretty central at least since, you know, 2007 or so, but I think its origins actually, I'm just kind of read something about this the other day, so I don't, I haven't looked into it deeply. Its origins might be in the late nineties, 98, I think is the earliest mention of it. So she wants to talk about it in terms of epistemic justice. Let's See, epistemic justice obviously would be what you achieve when you don't have any epistemic injustice. Epistemic injustice is something that occurs um, when people aren't valued properly as knowers, as people who, who make knowledge-based claims. So um, it has two different types. I don't really want to get too deep into it. One of them is called testimonial injustice. One of them is called hermeneutic hermeneutical injustice. Testimonial injustice is one of the two forms of epistemic injustice, and it means that when somebody speaks, um, the testimony that they give is not given the same level of credence that it would, would be if somebody else gave the testimony. So you could imagine, for example, if a woman or a black person or some marginalized group, because this is the way they think about it, were to say, this is my experience, and people were to kind of say, that's not really what's going on here. That would be an example of testimonial injustice. Uh, potentially, at least. Um, and according to their approach to it, definitely, always, every single time, believe all women. <laughs> That's the believe all women thing comes from a belief that that women are systemically uh, subjected to epistemic injustice about their experiences of, of sexual assault and sexual harassment. Um, the other side of it is hermeneutical injustice. And it occurs when 
people aren't considered to have the necessary epistemic resources to be able to have, you know, cogent or intelligent to say about a thing. So when you would say, for example, that uh, their other way of knowing isn't an adequate way of knowing, that would be hermeneutical injustice being perpetrated according to the theory. Um, But that turns out to be kind of the case. So she's going to be looking at the idea of, of equity in terms of epistemic justice, meaning the lack of those two different types of epistemic injustice, which will mean that what she's probably going to want to try to develop is the claim that um, in knowing spaces, so probably her classrooms is what she's thinking about, or in claims about uh, knowledge claims in general that might have some kind of an implication, that there is a devaluing of um, other ways of knowing. So rather than going into equity as it applies, you know, kind of much more obviously in education or uh, incarceration rates or whatever, as you normally would hear from people, she, she wants to go into this kind of very difficult academic space where it's about whose knowledge is considered valid and whose knowledge is not considered valid and why, um, whether it's their methods for knowing things that's hermeneutical injustice or whether it's the, the fact that they're they're uh, not treated fairly based on who they are and and thus their testimony is is ignored that's testimonial injustice that's that's the side that she's going to be concerned with so she's going to be concerned with equity in terms of basically anybody who makes a claim is essentially has to be considered much more seriously than maybe they need to be considered and that that's i think a very long summary, but I don't think she clearly understands what equity is to get back to the point where she pulled into this epistemic justice thing, which is interesting because her deep and motivating belief at the center of the video is equity, but she doesn't know what it is clearly enough to just talk about it directly, uh, which is, I think, typical when you see people who are caught up in some kind of a movement that it's again i told you at the beginning this is like a cultural thing that it's part of the culture to care about equity even if you don't quite know what it is but you have a vague sense of it and there's this moral impulse and intuition to push you one way or the other about equity related things um which makes this kind of a person very susceptible because she's not clear on what equity means she's not clear on how equity will be applied and what it looks like in application but she can be told well this is not equitable Therefore, it's bad and is likely to go with that. And this is equitable. Therefore, it's good and is likely to go with that as well. That's kind of the more salient point there than this whole epistemic justice, injustice thing. It reminds me of Rausch's humanitarian principle. Yeah. So, yeah, for anybody watching that doesn't know, Jonathan Rausch has a wonderful book called Kindly Inquisitors that came out in 1992, first time. And it's in several editions now, and it's one of the most important books to understand liberal thought that there is in print right now. Definitely one of the most important books of the last half century. And so he outlines the liberal principle in terms of how we we approach knowledge and truth, which is essentially kind of checking each by each. It has two core elements to it, one of which is nobody gets the final say and um, nothing is ever finally and settled and known. So you don't have any absolute appeals to authority and you don't have uh, any case closed. It's always an open question. And that which survives that process is, is, is knowledge. But then there's these other principles he shows that are competing with that. One of which is, as you said, the, the humanitarian principle, which is that we should not do things that do that, that hurt people's feelings, basically. So anything that's offensive should be kind of suppressed. Uh, any claims or arguments or whatever that could be be taken as offensive. Another one that's actually present here is his egalitarian and, in fact, radical egalitarian principles. The egalitarian principle is that basically kind of all arguments are kind of equal and fair or <laughs> they all have equal epistemic worth. And the radical egalitarian principle is that um, people who have been systematically excluded in the past actually have more epistemic worth because we need to make up for the fact that we've ignored them in the past. And so when she gets into the epistemic justice concept, those three things, which are extremely central to how uh, critical social justice thinks and, and, and behaves, are definitely relevant. So 
you definitely want to check out Roush on that and get get those ideas in your in your head when you start encountering this and you'll see he breaks down each one of them and talks about why they are not as good as um the kind of ruthless um philosophical if you're wrong you're wrong and we're all going to keep looking for it a liberal approach yeah like his main point is if you care about these marginalized groups the liberal principle is the way to go to help them as well as everyone i mean that's ultimately the thing isn't it if you if you really do care about anybody or any any particular group um you are not going to help them by giving them what is come along the way to be known as the soft bigotry of low expectations um if you say well you know what He's just right because of his race. You know, at that point, all of a sudden, people who understand how how knowledge is, is really generated are going to not see that person really as, as much of an expert. And then if you start enacting policy on what amounts to interpretation, uh, high, highly interpretive methods, then you're not going to enact uh, policies that address reality correctly. And I mean, we kind of see that going on with the virus right now is a lot of people are subjected to their, their desirability bias. They want the virus not to be as bad as it is, or they want uh, everything to be able to go back to normal sooner. So any news that they see that hits that, you know, they latch right onto it. Um, and hopefully that is the case. That's the point of desire of the desirability bias being desirable. Um, hopefully it is the case that, that, you know, the virus isn't as severe as, as we've feared, but that's the kind of thing that because it has high consequences, if we're wrong, you have to have really good evidence behind it. Um, this is sort of the same thing. If you, if you think that you're helping people by making, making it easier for them to make claims about the world, then uh, you're more likely to enact stuff that gets reality wrong and therefore ends up hurting them. Besides the fact that you, I mean, it's easier to talk about this in terms of concrete things like where they introduced the rule in California that every corporate board has to have at least one woman. Well, what happens when you do that? Uh, Unfortunately, it necessarily becomes the case because now merit wasn't the primary uh, or whatever setup it happened to be, if it's not all merit, merit was relevant. But now you have this other obvious stated exogenous var- variable to to capacity to do the job that has been uh, introduced. So any woman on any corporate board, she may be by far the most competent one on the board, but there's now room for reasonable doubt of that because there has to be a woman on the board. So maybe they didn't put the best person there. They just put somebody in because she's a woman. And so that really undercuts, uh, it really undercuts women professionally to do something like that. So when you do this in general, when you take this radical egalitarian principle and say, well, believe all women because we didn't believe them enough in the past, uh, you actually create a bad situation. It's a miss application of empathy is what it is it's 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 unfortunate Mm -hmm. right i want to keep going on the video yeah let's see what else vanessa has to say what do you mean by epistemic justice so epistemic justice is your version of history being the core curriculum my history being the elective Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. positionality you are a white male or a mm. white passing male. I am a native scholar. So mm. the dominant narrative in my K through 12 and continuing education in the anthropology department has been predominantly from a white lens. Let's just jump on that positionality briefly. Positionality means that you have to be aware of how your identity intersects or, or has impact that's relevant to um, systemic power systems. So the idea, in fact, comes from, it's like a modification uh, of, of what's called standpoint epistemology. The idea would be that as a, as a member of a dominant group in the dominant society, in other words, a white male in a society operated, uh, has been set up by white men, you won't be aware of what you're not uh, 
taking seriously what other knowledges you're not listening to. And so I know she's already started to say that epistemic injustice here or epistemic justice here would be that white people are required to listen more seriously to, to native scholars. For example, she's using the native American example because they've set up a system in the way, and remember, this is a knowledge system. They set up the system in a way where they fail to look at who they are and how they set the system up to privilege their own ways of knowing while excluding other ways of knowing. So she's going to probably be making the point that what white people need to be doing more of if they want epistemic justice is to make sure not to exclude native ways of knowing. And in fact, to treat them on par with say science or reason or rationality, which are being implicitly or sometimes explicitly associated with being white Western, um, sometimes male, uh, although that one's less common now. Yeah. It sounds like a complete rejection of impartiality. It's like the, it, when, when we think of knowing things through science, it's like particular people are, are uh, interchangeable it doesn't matter who you are, whatever you claim to know, anybody could know it if they did the same thing. Right. Because in science, the goal is to be as objective as possible. And even though that's not absolutely possible. And the way that you do that is by making the ultimate arbiter be reality, something external to any person. So it could be, you always get in trouble when you say this too. You, you could be a white person. It could be a black person. It could be a man. It could be a woman. It could be a gay straight person. It could be a gay person. It could be a robot. It could be a dog. It could be anything doing the experiment, but because the checking is occurring off of reality, off of actual external objective reality, the idea is that because anybody can check anybody, that those biases can actually be accounted for and cancel out. Uh, versus what's being forwarded in, in opposition is that people's narratives, people's individual narratives become the source. So uh, it's it's shifting away from objective measurements, which they would claim critical social justice claims that's not possible. It doesn't even exist. And we shouldn't want it even if it did exist because it would hide personal narrative. It's shifting into a position of of um, subjectivity where who somebody is makes a difference. So if, you know, you did the experiment and some black woman did the experiment, you're very likely to get different outcomes because of who you happen to be. And of course, if we were just doing basic science experiments, you know, like the kind of stuff you do in a chemistry kit with, you know, middle schoolers, obviously they usually don't think that that's all that influential there. But when you start talking about social, uh, factors and political decisions and things like that. They think it becomes very, very relevant. I mean, this shift though, from objective to subjective is one of the most, so this, this is, this isn't a small point. It is one of the most, um, significant and dangerous parts of the critical social justice thing. It's to move away from, and in fact, it's, for, it's a postmodern thing. It's to move away from the idea that there is any kind of access to objective reality and then into the idea that everybody based on their identity groups, as it turns out, that's not necessarily postmodern. It's a derivative of it, but everybody based on their identity groups has their own different, unique access to truth and I mean, that's a, that fractures the idea that we we sh can all know and appeal to a shared reality that's external to us and puts it on on subjective ground. And so, what's the problem with that? To appeal back to Rausch, um, Rausch describes the liberal approach as a method of conflict management which is a very interesting way to think about science or liberalism in general, is that you're managing conflict uh, when there's disagreement, inevitable disagreement. So when you have, this is a point Sam Harris made a long time ago, when you have nothing but subjective measurements, when you cannot appeal outside to some objective arbiter, eventually you hit conflicts for which there's no resolution. So you either have to embrace the paradox, which is impossible when you actually have to take action one way or another, or you have to resort to some means other than um, knowledge production to solve the discrepancy. And throughout human history, we've chosen violence as the way might eventually makes right. Right now, the difference is that it used to be a very um, physical might, and now it's this kind of like rhetorical 
thing. Like as if violence isn't really relevant because we've had a very nonviolent society for a while now. So all of a sudden it's like whoever can, I don't even want to say make the argument because I don't want to confuse it like with philosophy. It's whoever can, can plead their case and, and plead in a very emotional sense. Um, becomes correct. And in fact, the critical social justice mindset is whoever has the best claim on having been systemically oppressed gets to be right anytime these conflicts come up. So whoever is the most aggrieved becomes right. And um, a dangerous road to walk uh, because reality doesn't care who is the most aggrieved. It just doesn't. Yeah, I could imagine, you know, this way of thinking implemented in policy that would harm a lot of people like maybe there's native american casinos that possibly remain open because some people you know their way of knowing re- you know, disregards this thing like a virus yeah i mean the the most emergency level kind of stuff would be with around the virus setting policy based on the idea that uh you know um Maybe there's a cultural tradition that says that when people are sick, they should come together more or <laughs> that that's sort of a problem. Right. And then maybe there's a cultural tradition about different medical approaches or what you should do with dead bodies or whatever. And it's really during an infectious disease, you really want to appeal to one that has a reliable track ma- track record of getting right answers and not create this kind of confusion um, and not create. I mean, with with something like a pandemic, it it affects everybody. So if any people are deciding, libertarians are deciding that they don't need to stay home and uh, avoid getting the disease, uh, then those people become people who spread the disease more and prolong other people's potential uh, capacity to get sick. So... If people are, you know, possibly contagious, let's say they they do contract it for, you know, well over two weeks, every person who goes out and gets it just prolonged the whole thing by up to two weeks. <laughs> um, so deciding to ignore that, whether it's for a cultural tradition or political beliefs or whatever, uh, it, it's it's not good. That's why you want to have the ability to not descend into narrative and instead to understand that different methods of knowing are actually objectively better than others. They get, I keep trying to tell people that, you know, truth is a complicated concept, but what truth really means in a practical sense is being able to make a statement about reality, being able to bet on that statement and reliably win. Um, That's what truth is really about here. And it's, it's not about how you feel. It's about, when reality gets up to the to the plate, as they say, reality bats last. When reality gets up to the plate, it's that we've we've come to the the we, we've we've got our pitch ready so that it has the best chance of of getting past the bat uh, and into the catcher's mitt. So that's ultimately what we're talking about here. Yeah, when the future future information is in high demand, you tend to go to scientists to to get that type of information, like the models people have with this infection rate and death rate, that's high demand information of what's going to be happening like tomorrow or a week from now. And uh, we've been testing these models against reality to try to make reliable predictions that we can bet on to make policy. So yeah, it's, it's, and this way of knowing this, this worldview seems to reject all of that, which is a problem. Well, it does. It says that it's, it's local to one race, maybe sometimes one sex or gender, um, to one particular kind of cultural thing, the Western or Eurocentric, what, what Ben Shapiro would probably call Judeo-Christian, uh, which we should all amend to be Judeo-Christian, heavily tempered by Enlightenment secularism, but nevertheless, not to mm-hmm. ride any hobby horses today. Uh, it says that, that something like scientific knowledge is just the cultural knowledge of white Western people. So maybe men. And then other knowledges possibly exist as well. And this is where they go wrong. It's only because white Western men run the white Western system that they're not aware that other knowledges are just as good 
as science. It's because they favor their oh. own culture rather than because it's actually better. Um, that you really, it takes some time to get it in your head that the way that they think about the world when they've taken up critical social justice is that everything is just culture and everybody's culture tries to promote itself. And if it gets power, it tries to maintain its power and it doesn't even know that it's doing it. Um, that's a type of false consciousness known as internalized dominance. They don't even know that they're doing it. And so white people, because they have privilege and power, according to theory, have um, are, are not aware of the fact that they're doing this. They just think that their methods are better. So you can kind of like an analogy would be like, you can think about families or whatever, you know, it's like, this is the Jones way or whatever. And, you know, they have their little way that they're going to go about, you know, organizing the house or whatever, where stuff is of small consequence. And so every different family kind of has their own way of organizing their house. And that's how it is. And it's like taking that to the, to, to the maximal possible degree to believe that every way to produce knowledge is just local to that race or culture or whatever. And that culture thinks its way is the best for ultimately bad reasons to, because they, they, of course they do is more or less the reason. That's, that's very disturbing. <laughs> I want to keep going. Yeah. I've lost Vanessa now. We got to figure out what she's saying. Yeah. So epistemic justice would be instead of asking white anthropologists about these natives or indigenous people hmm. would be actually asking the natives and the hmm. um, indigenous peoples to tell their story and accept it as truth. Hmm. There it is. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Both of us tried to do the pause thing at the same time. So it, epistemic justice would be to not to ask a white anthropologist, but to ask the native people themselves and accept what they say as truth. Um, as if there can be no understanding from an outsider. As if, as if in fact, an outsider's perspective wouldn't possibly uh, shed, and not, whether informed or not, but informed makes it even better. But an outsider's perspective is is often very elucidating to all of your blind spots and biases. So it's really interesting because this this mindset in critical social justice is obsessed with sussing out hidden biases and unexamined assumptions. That's in fact the best name that it has for itself. When you say, "Well, what's it, what's critical theory about?" It's about uncovering un you know underexamined assumptions and finding and, and finding biases that people aren't aware of. And then it's like leaning into its own biases so hard because it's so obsessed with the idea of systems of power that it only applies that to dominant groups like white people or men or whatever. So men need to examine their biases while women get to magnify their own. And white people need to examine their biases while every other race gets to magnify its own. Just accept what we say is truth. And then when you have something like you say a white anthropologist, blah, 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 well, Take the word white out. What if it's a black anthropologist? What if it's, you know, it doesn't matter who's doing it. That's the point is if you have somebody who's actually trained to understand how cultures tend to manifest and operate, and they've seen maybe through their study and their, their research, maybe 40 different cultures, and they see different patterns and different trends. When they encounter a culture, say like a Native American culture, they might have a very keen insight into why whatever's occurring there is occurring in terms of how cultures are analyzed. So that expertise even becomes more relevant, not just the outsiders, you know, maybe you're blind to something here, uh, bias thing, the expertise also becomes relevant. So this is, this is a, what she's calling epistemic justice sounds great. Justice is good. We want it. I don't necessarily, personally, I do, but a lot of people will hear it and say, I don't know what epistemic means, but justice is good. We want justice. Justice is great. Yeah, we've been unfair to Native Americans. We were really unfair to them, blah, blah, blah. We need justice. Justice is important. And they're ready to go along with this. But what she's actually saying is that uh, epistemic justice is achieved when people are allowed to lean into their own biases so long as they're not the dominant racial or cultural group. And that's a, it's a, it's a nightmare. It's actually exactly backwards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
All right, let's keep going. So, for instance, um, museums house Kachina ancestors. You might see them as Kachina dolls. So, within a Native American epistemology, those are not dolls, and that's disrespectful. They are Kachina ancestors. But ah. for indigenous peoples... There you go. So, check that out. The, 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 the epistemology is based on what's disrespectful. So mm. if you say something that disagrees with us and it insults us, then you're necessarily wrong, right? So the amplification of offense, something hurting somebody's feelings or something, you know, disrespecting their, their traditions or the, the way that they view the world um, becomes a reason to claim that what they're saying is true. See, the, the claim here is about these ancestors is that unless you see them literally according to the same cultural tradition that they do, you're disrespectful. That causes harm. Therefore, like psychological harm, therefore you're wrong and they are right. And that's, mm -hmm. um, again, the arbiter stopped being reality. Like, I don't know for sure what, Kachina ancestors are made out of, I'm assuming they're made out of clay or, you know, wood or something that, that can be carved into these figures or shaped into these figures. And then to, in reality, as in, in actual reality, that is not, a, they're not living things. You can believe lots of different things about them, but in reality, they are not li living things. That's not, actually an ambiguous uh, claim about the world. Um, according to what, I mean, according to no definition, are they living? It's actually a, you, you're not allowed to call it a superstition. I'm stumbling around all my words because I know how they, I know how they would, would respond to what I'm trying to say in a very plain way. But this is, this is a superstition. It's an extraordinary claim. Yeah. It, yeah, it is an absolutely extraordinary claim that, that, I would say, stumbling here, it's like, I want to say, according to the literal definition of life as given by <laughs> biology that all biologists would agree to, there's no way these things qualify as alive. Absolutely no way. And then the the retort would be, well, that's because white people devised biology to have a definition of life that would exclude this kind of thing. And so you can see how that claim of of systemic power tainting the ability to to have alternative ways of knowing comes into play, right? So white people created biology, they created the definition of life so that that doesn't include things like Kachina ancestors. Therefore, the white people have a definition of life that's too narrow, but they don't even know it because they think it's just the definition of life. And that's why we need epistemic justice that opens up the idea of living thing to a broader conception, including so-called Native American epistemologies. And within the logic, I stumbled around so much trying to say all this because within the logic, that's internally consistent. The point isn't whether or not it's internally consistent as a philosophy or something like that, which sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Intersectionality gets messy. But the point is that it actually divorces from reality. The, the, the definition of life is meant to describe something that is actually occurring in reality. Mm -hmm. And that real thing is, is occurring regardless of what we call it. And the ancestors that are figures carved or, or shaped out of something do not qualify for whatever that process is. And it doesn't matter what we call it. There is a process that is life and they don't qualify on an objective level. And so all of this haggling takes place in this kind of abstract verbal world. And it's ultimately like this kind of weird semantic game where it's like, well, what does this word mean? What does living really mean? And who, and it, with, with critical social justice, it's never, what does the word mean? It's how does it advantage the group who created and defined the word to make it that way? It's always that who does it, who's, who benefits from it being defined this way? So Defining life as rigorously and carefully as possible would be seen from their perspective as somehow encoding benefit 
to the white people who made it because, for example, now they have a de- definition of life that gets to ex- exclude Kachina ancestors from being living. And so they benefit because they control what happens with that, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, ugh, it's so frustrating because this is the kind of like, I mean, this is like fucking LSD philosophy. It's like the kind of thing people do when they're high and think that they're profound, but somehow it's become immensely persuasive. Uh, I don't even want to guess at the psychological reasons why it's become so persuasive, but ultimately that's what they are is is group psychological reasons that just become persuasive. Yeah, it seems just a status game. A way to get prestige in this community is to, you know, respect marginalized groups as much as you can. And one way is ex- respecting claims like this. Right. And as far as the epistemology goes, it's a switch from how do we tell? So the, the question becomes, how do we tell what's true? And the switch is a way from by bouncing it off of reality or giving the best possible arguments to figure it out and cutting those arguments down through a process of criticism and so on. And it has switched over to whoever is being cheated by the existing system must be right. So it's a the, when she says Native American Native American epistemologies and then argues the way that she's arguing, she's including as a Native American epistemology that if you don't feel like your argument's been taken seriously enough, then it must be correct, as long as it's coming from uh, or arguing on behalf of a Native American thing. That, again, that doesn't that's that's not helpful. Um, there are ways to to engage pluralistically around uh, you know, different cultures existing in the same, you know, physical space or even political space, but saying, oh, well, you've got a bigger claim on having been cheated by the system. Therefore you're right. Isn't really a great one of them. Um, it doesn't lend itself to trying to figure out how to respect and honor their honor traditions while not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It actually is like, it encourages, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. And then having an irresolvable conflict that, again, is going to have to resort to some other means that we probably don't want to, to resolve the conflict. It's, it's just such right. backwards thinking. Yeah. And I, I will admit, I remember hearing, I don't know if it's about Kachina ancestors or not. I don't think it was. I think it was about some, some tribe's uh, tradition of making masks. And I remember hearing a thing about whether or not they should, uh, years ago, a decade ago or so about whether or not they should be housed in museums or whether they should be, you know, only allowed to be treated the way that the tribe treats them. And I absolutely understand that there's, these are difficult issues. Like the museum is trying to archive and protect these objects, but according to the beliefs, you know, that that's not what they're meant for. So even if they had to be destroyed by nature, eventually that's better because that's what they're actually for. And so, you know, should the, should the museum house a replica and then explain why it has to be a replica and how the replica was made? I mean, there's a lot of interesting questions or possible solutions to this, but just asserting what you're claiming is as true is false because it is disrespectful. If it's true, um, isn't going to be a way to resolve that kind of conflict. Yeah. Those those ways of meeting those concerns sound reasonable, but accepting something extraordinary is not. Yeah. So cool. Let's keep going. So, and everything has a lifespan. Nothing is meant to be preserved. Everything had runs its course um, and dies. So Kachina ancestors are basically being held captive in museums because the Pueblo epistemological standpoint is disregarded for the dominant epistemology of preserving Kachina ancestors for the sake of white people to exoticize them. Hmm. Let me re- that's epistemic justice. That's awesome. That's a really good way of laying it out. Look at the morally charged language thrown on there, right? So mm-hmm. she's at first talking about how, oh, we're going to preserve them. And the tribe thinks that they should be um, allowed to pass away and fine that 
belief fine everything is supposed to run its course and pass away and so this thing is now being prevented from doing that and that symbolism is important to the tribe for various reasons and now it's being prevented from doing it so in a sense it's almost like holding whatever that thing symbolizes is being held captive and prevented you know from seeing a thing out of an act of preservation so you have this kind of like okay you can see the conflict now the disagreement between the cultural issue and then the the other cultural drive which is to preserve um treasured artifacts that, that tell the story of the people and, and help people understand and, and see what's going on you know the whole thing at the point of a museum and then all of a sudden it's oh well white people just are doing it so they can exoticize them and that there you have this like moral implications like white people don't actually the people trying to preserve these things aren't actually trying to preserve them they're trying to say oh look how exotic these other people are they're different this comes out of actually post-colonial theory um so the roots are clear in the literature it's straight up you know oh well you have the dominant white western eurocentric type and then you have the exotic foreigner other east south whatever it happens to be so the global south the global east are considered to be major sites within um post-colonial theory but you also within the ca- case of indigenous cultures you would have you know the Ind- uh, first peoples or native peoples or whatever they get called in different contexts uh, aboriginal people uh in the australian context for example they have different names in different places the idea that oh well white people just see them as other as not white becomes like part of that dominating narrative that comes in. So it can't be that, oh, we have this culture that wants to preserve artifacts and create knowledge and share knowledge and blah, blah, blah. And that's good. And it helps, you know, this, that, and the other thing. But then we also have this tradition that sees things this way. And that symbolism is very important for these reasons, those reasons. And let's try to come together and create a solution to this. Uh, You now have this, well, the people just don't care and they want to control the thing and they aren't trying to preserve it. They're trying to do so only so they can make say, Oh, look how exotic these non-Western cultures are. Um, of course, these will, things will be housed half the time in a museum that 50 feet away or less is going to have some Anglo-Saxon boat, you know, preserved from the 12th century or something that very, very, very plainly isn't there to be exoticized at all. It's there for that preservation and storytelling and whatever else. So it's like, let's just throw a moral implication based on this. Everything is unfair systems of power mindset. And then you can see, again, the point is they keep saying the word epistemology. They keep saying the word epistemic. So this is about knowledge and truth and getting to the truth. And, and all of a sudden, though, boom, here's this morally charged thing. This is where it's like a shift to the, the, it's a shift away from like empiricism and rationality and argument and to emotion and rhetoric. And we've spent most of human history with emotion and rhetoric and appointed, uh, um, I, I was going to say gurus, but I'm going to get myself in trouble. Uh, who are are the arbiters of what is and isn't true. Kings, priests, prophets, uh, witch doctors, whatever it happens to be, those are the people who really know. We've spent most of human history that way, and growing out of that has been difficult and has brought us modernity. And so this is an invitation. People call these people regressive left, and it's like they're not regressive like regressive to the 1950s. I mean, that's regressive back to like, hunter-gatherer days yeah Yeah. it's like hunter-gatherer it's like literally backwards almost to and again the context makes it uncomfortable to say tribal time um it's it's completely pre uh, well you can't say civilizational it's not quite pre-civilizational it's pre um it's pre pre pre-modernity it's pre-modern so they are you know the idea of this kind of highly technological Modern society with its very low infant mortality rates, its very low low um, incidences of other like maternal mortality rates, uh, very low rates of disease, relatively speaking, and so on and so forth. This world is somehow the problem in that view. And if we could just go back to everybody having their own local superstitions and then pretend everybody would be able to just get along all the time by respecting them without ever giving an answer as to how you resolve conflict besides whoever's the most aggrieved wins, which stops working when everybody starts claiming they're the most aggrieved. Um, 
I have no idea what they think they're they're going to accomplish. I think about it. I can't. I don't don't exaggerate. Every time I go through an airport, I think about it like obsessively. Every time I go to a city and ride in the subway, I think about it obsessively. I just think, how the hell do pe- I go to the grocery store half the time and think about it? Do these people think that when we give up on objective knowledge, that all of this stuff just continues? Because I see how they act. So they live like the most first world privileged existences half the time ever. And so uh, do they just think like food distribution networks are just going to continue? Do they think the planes are just going to keep flying? Do they, This stuff doesn't come for free. It's actually really difficult. Um, it wasn't until very long ago. 80% of us needed to work to produce food for everybody. But now it's like 2% of people. Like, it's, right. Are, there's still groceries you know, in the, in the grocery store right now. That's crazy. Right. When when the United States was founded, it was 95% agrarian. 95% of us were borderline subsistence, in many cases, farmers. Like you literally, if you couldn't grow enough, you starved to death in the winter, unless you had friends who would feed you who did grow enough. Uh, One bad winter could wipe out a significant part of the population. And now, like you said, it's like, what flavor of Cheez-Its do you want? There are 30 of them and you can get them at every store in North America. I want to make sure I understand your example. Mm -hmm. Um, Pardon me for, 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 for for listening. I, I, I I just, I I couldn't help but overhearing what you said. Mm -hmm. So, um, are you saying that in Native American culture, um, what, what we call dolls, they call Katinas? The Kachina ancestors, they're ancestors, they're not dolls. And they live lives and then they, the, the, uh. Couple of things there. Um, clearly, first of all, the guy interrupting is kind of making a point that outside of the epistemic system, he's not doing a great job thinking outside of the epistemic system though the you know is the the ancestor concept is the key of the kachina thing not not the kachina itself so you know he's actually kind of helping point out that there is a point being made within this now she's not explaining it very well either because she as it turns out you know she's thought about these things and they're all in theory but she doesn't really seem to understand it either, or at least she feels like it's very difficult to explain it um, to somebody who doesn't seem to understand it. Um, I, as I said, you know, I've seen this before. I, she dips in and out of both worlds. So it's uh, the very social justice oriented world and then dips back. And I'm not saying she's dipping in and out of native American epistemology. I don't get the impression she speaks into that very clearly at all. Um, based on the fact that very little clarity comes through when she does. But uh, on the other hand, um, she's, she, she's in the so-called dominant frame a lot. And she seems when we get to the second video, when she talks about truth, it really kind of starts sticking out that she can't maintain her belief that she doesn't really believe in truth. And so, um, it's just an interesting thing to, to, to look at there, uh, but from within theory, it would be explained that her her thinking has been colonized by those dominant methods. So she struggles too, but that in fact is a, an act of oppression against her. It is in fact a form of what's called epistemic oppression or even epistemic violence being done against her where she has had her, she can't even have her own um, genuine or authentic experience because she's been colonized and that's literally the world word colonized by white Western dominant conceptions of knowledge. Um, and because those are actually the, the two pieces to it, one side is that they are cultural and the other side of it is that they actually do work. Um, undeniably. So it gets, I find that this happens a lot. I see people talking about it who are trying to, to promote critical social justice and they seem not to be able to maintain it because they're caught on the in between the the horns of that kind of dilemma that it is arguable to be cultural in certain ways but at the same time it's undeniable that it works so they slip into they slip into revealing the fact that they don't they don't fully believe what they're saying 
um, in a functional sense, but they I, they probably do fully believe it and they probably wrestle with it a lot. Uh, but you can kind of see it with her. Um, but also this guy that butted in kind of made her point for her a little bit. So I'll give, give some credit to that. This is why, by the way, I say that the point of like, what do we do? What, what positive forward direction do we take from critical social justice and all of its activity? The, the positive point is that we can always remember to listen and consider more seriously. We can listen better. We can consider things more realistically and we can open up, you know, to different perspectives in a pluralistic sense that way. At the same time, listen and believe goes way too far. So it's listen mm-hmm. and consider, not listen and believe is a, is a take home message. Although you can't really expect somebody who's never heard of Kachina ancestors to understand it in two seconds either. Um, just kind of to be fair to everybody here. I think that, that he did kind of help make her point when he just did not grasp that the ancestor part is the the most important part and i come into this not knowing it i had not heard of kachina ancestors before this but I immediately registered when she called them ancestors that there was something that mm-hmm. that's the relevant piece there right um yeah it's, yeah it's fascinating the what is it called the elements the elements take them they have lives and then they're supposed to deteriorate and move on mm. but for the sake of preservation exoticism from Oh, a dominant white perspective. That's just so super uncharitable. <laughs> That's what it is. Is it's anything that that the dominant groups are doing is it has to be interpreted as uncharitably as possible, and as a means of exerting power over uh, the the groups that are considered marginalized or oppressed. So the poison here isn't like, hey, listen to us about these ancestors. As I think I've waffled about a bit now, the point is that. It's the, the problem with critical social justice is seeing everything through this lens of power that I mean, when people ask us, why did we call it grievance studies? Well, this is it's not even just um, talking about social grievances. It's like finding the aggrieved position to take, you know, oh, they're, they claim they're trying to preserve it, but really they're trying to exoticize it. They're trying to fetishize us. And it's like, oh, it's so uncharitable. And that's at the center of that critical mentality. And that's actually the poison to think that everything is some cynical manipulation of power. That's why Helen and I call her book Cynical Theories, as a matter of fact, is because Mm -hmm. the idea that it's always a cynical manipulation of power at the heart of everything. It's like, is there something going on here that might be wrong? It may be possibly sure. Let's talk about it and have a conversation about it and look at it. It from from more angles, great. It, but then you're going to sit down and accuse the person of, well, this is offensive, and this cuts across this, and this cut. This is you're exoticizing us. Your your motivations are all nasty and terrible, and it's just not the way to do it. It's just such a poisonous way, and, and such a divisive way, and such an unproductive way to approach any problems in this situation that are actually real. And again, it dissolves the ability to have conflict resolution or conflict management and just turns it into more and more conflict. That's the exact opposite of what you want in a pluralistic society. This, by the way, is the difference between pluralism and multiculturalism and why pluralism tends to work and multiculturalism tends not to work. One's more, and it depends on what you mean by those things, but multiculturalism is holding people up in division Whereas pluralism is trying to, you know, mix, integrate and learn from one another. Melting pot ideology, for example, but melting pot is considered an ideology in (laughs) in a a bad way that's trying to erase other cultures. (sighs) Again, however, whatever the most nasty, cynical interpretation you can come up with to blame whatever group is relatively dominant, that's what's got to be the case. And that that thinking is the poison. Is it so hard to just imagine a Native American, you know, guy inherits these these dolls from their from his grandparents who die or something, and we find this nice museum that loves this culture, wants to preserve it, and he lovingly donates these dolls for preservation? I don't understand how that's wrong in any way. I mean, I, it's the thing is, is you've just got two conflicting motives and understanding of what the the 
the what's most important with regard to the figures. Um, whether it is that they live out their symbolic life and are ultimately destroyed and taken apart by by nature as and then whatever symbolic meaning is there or whether they are to be preserved so that people can understand and know about that culture more widely and for longer periods of time. There's just two conflicting approaches or understandings there. And those those conflicting understandings, there are better and worse ways to to navigate that. I don't I, I don't want to say that there are easy answers like, oh, putting them in a museum is clearly the right answer. Maybe putting some of them, maybe there's a compromise. Maybe there's something, maybe there's replicas. Of course, one of the ones that they're really going to be interested in is going to be the fact that they're going to be ones that are actually hundreds of years old, more than likely or thousands of years old, um, which kind of speaks more testament to the fact that they're not actually alive, uh, whether that's offensive or not. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. They're held captive in museums held captive. for the sake of preservation. Um which completely negates an entire epistemological mm-hmm. standpoint. Completely yeah, negates I think that's all that other way. Of oh, was See, that it negates minutes? that. That was actually four minutes. And oh, awesome. uh, if you don't mind, I can interview you next. But um, I would like to kind of just do a one-on-one. And would that, would that be okay? Um, all right. Well, it's a fascinating topic. Maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Um, do you have to go, or do you want to I, keep I going? Do, do you really? I Darn do. it. Poor so, Anthony. She, poor Anthony. That was like he was super excited about that because. This stuff is fascinating to both him and me. Yeah. So, but you did come back in another video on another day and want to want to keep going? Yeah. Yeah. The second mm-hmm. one's much more interesting, actually. Yeah. Here's my epistemic justice person coming. How are you? Good. Timer. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Is it setting the timer? Only if you have time to talk. Okay, it's got four minutes. That's the white four man's rule, Vanessa. Four minutes, because it's such a complicated topic. <laughs> It is. These are four-minute segments. I know. But usually we hit the four minutes and the person wants to keep talking. Are you okay if I continue to record? Sure. Okay. Here we go. There we go. I appreciate you coming back. Yeah. If I remember right, we were kind of in the midst of a conversation. We were getting into equality, epistemic justice, Mm -hmm. this idea of um, if a marginalized group thinks that something is true, if it's their story, then it's true, perhaps. We can get into that. And then somebody came up and, and found our conversation interesting and yeah. kind of threw it off. And then the timer beeped and then you had to run. Yeah. So I guess we can, can we can we pick up that same topic first? Are yeah. you okay if we do that? Yeah. Uh, you had mentioned equity as a possible topic. And then in order to explain it, we needed to talk about epistemic justice. Mm-hmm. Well, well, because equity is a broad, um, a broad umbrella. So we can apply equity to epistemic justice, equity to professionalism, equity to um, access to resources, you know, so I specifically Mm. talked about it in um, an epistemic justice. Okay. Okay. I think the epistemic justice topic Mm -hmm. caught my attention more perhaps than even the equity part of it. Mm -hmm. Although maybe maybe we can't even discuss the epistemic justice part without the equity, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Well, epistemic justice would be equity, but it's there's a clash of epistemology. So, I don't I don't see how we could ever reconcile the two. Because if if I make the statement, the scientific method isn't of itself a pseudoscience. If you find that statement to be like, whoa, like whoa, that makes me uncomfortable. Oh. Notice again that the appeal is this statement makes me uncomfortable. So we are still in a <laughs> epistemological standpoint where whether or not something makes you, how something makes you feel has something to do with whether or not it's true. This is postmodernism. The, the idea is that um, we can't relate to an objective standard. So we have to relate to our, our own lived experiences of how things are to understand things. That's the different epistemologies. And so our lived experience contains how we feel about things. So thus how we feel about things has some bearing on whether or not we believe that they're true. And that has some bearing upon what, whether or not it is true uh, from our perspective. So this is equivocating around on the word true and what it means. But the, the big thing here is where she says, if I said that the scientific method is a form of pseudoscience and that makes you feel uncomfortable, 
then no, 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 that, that's actually, <laughs> if you want to talk about the dominant epistemological uh, perspective, the dominant, the meaning the one that actually works, um, which is a, a different thing altogether. It, how you feel about that statement means absolutely nothing. It's only how good is that method at getting to right answers about the world. And if it hurts your feelings or if it hurts my feelings or if it hurts anybody's feelings, that sucks. We're all at different times in our lives on the losing end of something we want to be true, not being true. And, um, the, the, if that makes you uncomfortable is, is actually irrelevant here. Um, the scientific method actually makes people uncomfortable all the time. The theory of evolution, here we are, you know, over 150 years since Darwin laid it down, it's still making people uncomfortable. It, it makes people, sci the, f finding out real truths about reality makes people uncomfortable, making claims that that doesn't matter. Tr truth doesn't care. I mean, I hate to sound like Ben Shapiro. The facts don't care about your feelings. Um, and the, the opposite perspective is being given here is that feelings don't really care about your facts. So uh, I guess that's like Hume, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the idea that we would, would would encourage ourselves to go into epistemologies that have something to do with how ideas make us feel is um, a bit solipsistic and, and definitely dangerous. But that's clearly the mindset in which um, this... Uh, this individual is operating because that's what she's concerned about. Maybe that statement makes you uncomfortable. I remember from God Inquisitors, Roush puts it, a no offense society is a no knowledge society. So let us be frank. Once and for all, creating knowledge is painful for the same reason that it can also be exhilarating. Knowledge does not come free to any of us. We have to suffer for it. We have to stand naked before the court of critical checkers and watch our most cherished beliefs come under fire. Sometimes you have to watch while our notion of evident truth gets tossed in the gutter. Sometimes you feel we are treated rudely, even viciously. As others prod and test and criticize our ideas, we feel angry, hurt, embarrassed. I am certainly not saying that we should all go out and be offensive or inflammatory just for the sake of it. Please don't paint swastikas on the synagogue and say I gave my blessing. I am against offending people for fun. But I am also only too well aware that in the pursuit of knowledge many people, probably most of us at one time or another, will be hurt, and that this is a reality which no amount of wishing or regulating can ever change. It is not good to offend people, but it is necessary. A no offense society is a no knowledge society. It's true. It's um, it's a society in which uh, all you have are competing claims, and then um, people whining about them, and everything's murky, and then the the, the trains and the planes aren't going anymore, and there's no cheese its at the grocery store for mm -hmm. us to all enjoy. All right, let's keep going. I will add that I'm, you know, I'm not meaning to pick on this young woman. She's, she's obviously a college student and trying to learn about this stuff. So this isn't about picking on. Yeah. It's just, it's just a really good example. It's like these conversations are so rare. It takes someone like Anthony, just random guy on a college campus to actually pick the brain of people like this. It's really rare to get people who will come out and just have dialogue about it without, um, just getting mad and telling you to go do your homework or calling you a name. So this is just, this is gold. This is good, good stuff. You are operating from within the dominant epistemological standpoint. Dominance. It's always dominance. What's dominant? Native blah, blah, blah. and indigenous epistemologies, ways of learning and thinking and, and understanding have their own scientific methods as we would call them. So the, the, the dominance thing, actually, that I kind of uh, jumped on is really important here. It's, again, the mindset is always about how systemic power, therefore politics, are relevant to everything. So now it's how is politics relevant to knowledge? It's how do we make knowledge more of a political process instead of less of a political process? Um, so when you keep hearing them say things like, what's well, the dominant perspective, dominant knowledge, dominant this, dominant that, that's really what it's talking about. Um, how do we make this issue, how do we bring politics to bear on epistemology or on knowledge? And 
that of course is a nightmare. Um, you want your politics as far away from knowledge as possible, but what they would argue back is that's impossible. It's always there. So let's amplify it and, and really have it out. Um, but when she says that dominant thing there, how does dominance act? That's the mindset. It's all of the concepts that I've, we talked about in the encyclopedia have something to do. It, it's almost annoying to write it because it's like over and over and over again, I have to write. And in critical social justice, this means in a systemic sense where the power dynamics of dominance and oppression are somehow centrally relevant. And it's the critical theorist's job to uncover those, make them more visible. That's that phrase, make oppression visible. Um, also make dominance visible. The, the power dynamic is assumed to be relevant to everything and at the center of everything. So that's why they have these uncharitable takes, because it's not about let's find out what's really true. It's let's find out how dominance is preventing us from seeing other perspectives. Yeah, you're saying every gap and outcome is just assumed to be some type of oppression is a that? result of some kind of oppression. Yeah. Because their view is totally socially constructivist. So everything is social constructions. And so, because that means they're all kind of fake and arbitrary and thus um, there should be in principle, no differences whatsoever. There should be no achievement gaps for any reason whatsoever. If everything is just social, socially constructed, if all the differences are socially constructed, they're not real. So there shouldn't be any differences. So if we see differences, those differences must be due to something. And the something must be discrimination or the unjust application of power to different identity groups. That's the, that's like the core doctrine of the, the worldview here. That is the, that is the, you know, Jesus was resurrected from my sins of critical social justice. Wow crazy different methods yes um do these different methods bring us all to the same factual truth of the matter well when it comes to there is no truth <laughs> this is Here this is the problem with um education as we know it because what we have been fed and given in our k-12 is this history of the founding fathers so Rather than just answering a straightforward question, because she knows she knows what the answer is supposed to be, and she knows what her ideology says the answer has to be, and those don't match. So instead, let's blame a system. It's always, let's blame the system. Let's find an ins institution that's been corrupted by the system or built upon that system. Let's blame that instead. So th the mindset is always, again, that dominance is reproducing itself through the systems of society. So what we're seeing here is a shift where she's now going to try to talk about systems instead of trying to um, just answer the question because she knows that at, I think she knows at the same time that there is an objective reality, that there is a factual truth It's a very simple question and that she needs to deny it to continue to make the case for epistemic justice as she's defined it um, as a feature of, of, equities. It'd be kind of like an epistemic equity. And so instead, she has to, to divert and start talking about how the system of education has fed us certain things and brainwashed us in a sense into, into a certain way of thinking, a certain mindset. And that mindset is actually dominance and how dominance reproduces itself throughout society. And that's how we all get socialized into dominance. So the mindset's always let's identify a system or an institution or a institution in service to the system that um, pushes dominance on people. So that, again, that pushes back even further that the deeper mindset is always that dominance is somehow at the core of whatever's going on and whatever claim they want to make. They're only not able to make it because they're being unfairly politically persecuted or oppressed or marginalized by some dominant system. There's no possibility that the system is actually just effective because that's that that would violate another core uh, dogma here, which is the cultural relativism. So you can kind of see that where she's now immediately pivoted and shifted into let's talk about the education system instead, because we're going to talk about how we're all socialized to think a certain way. And there's not a certain way to think because that way she can maintain her argument about epistemic justice uh, in different ways of knowing. It sounds like a conspiracy theory or something. These systems. It is. In fact, I've characterized it in the past as a conspiracy theory with no conspirators in particular. 
uh, or another way to put it would be as a conspiracy theory where we are all made conspirators. And that view actually is kind of the, the view of power that was pushed by um, Michel Foucault. So that's, you know, when I, when I keep kind of alluding that this is postmodern, this is postmodern, this is postmodern, the thing she's saying is coming out of postmodernism. That is the the thought of, of Michel Foucault is that, it, I mean, they, they did use it to a degree in the other branches of critical theory, which saw society as having adopted the ideologies of the elite and enforcing them through what what's called hegemony in society, which is controlling how people think and act by by giving them various ideological viewpoints, where the ideological viewpoints are that which are created by the elites and service to the elites. So you can kind of see how this is like this whole weird mindset, though, uh, comes from Foucault. So, yeah, it's, it goes deep. It, it does. I mean, it, it's it's really weird because it's a very peculiar way of thinking that in some sense is very postmodern and in other senses is very uh, neo-Marxist, which gives credence to um, Jordan Peterson for calling it postmodern neo-Marxism, although that's itself complicated and confusing because neither postmodernism in and of itself nor neo-Marxism in and of itself are the thing that's operating now. This is kind of its own hybrid and mutated entity. Yeah, a totally different thing. Yeah, let's just keep going. This white history. So now that white history groups, um, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Native Americans are fighting for their own studies, their own accounts of history as they see it happen, as they um, experienced it. Now we want to change the language to this is a perspective. This is this oh. is another person's perspective. So hmm. we like to we scholars, white scholars, like to play with language in this way that we almost a, she was Native American a minute ago. Yeah, what someone else said and uses it to do the same thing but call it something else. So, for instance, um, the 45th president. Um, went through a time where Trump's oh name. we're not it's not a border wall we're looking at slats okay he, he, was, he was like don't call it a border we're not looking at a wall that's old we're there we're looking at steel slats this is the obsession with language and how powerful language is i guess in society it is so the obsession with language is really deep here but um it's again, it's one of those tricky things because there's a point here. Of course, I do think since we're not supposed to say his name anymore, we're supposed to say the 45th president, or you know who, um, <laughs> he who must not be named. Uh, sure. Since since uh, the 45th president um, is himself very postmodern in his, in his approach, he's very post-truth. It's very uh, narrative driven. That media which insults him and offends him is is fake news so now we're talking about it's it, there is no truth though there's just perspectives and again we come back to the question though how do you resolve conflict right there is a kernel to truth with this whole language thing that language and rhetoric and are very persuasive they can have a lot of effect they can lead people to behave in, in, in particular ways and be political in certain ways and understand things a certain way but the whole point of kind of the whole liberal project, in particular Rausch's liberal science, which is relevant because we're talking about epistemology and knowledge acquisition, is that you are going to have these conflicts come up and you need a reliable method to resolve them. So leaning into something that's more about perspectives, perspectivalism is what it's sometimes called, is exactly the backwards thing to do. Leaning into something where we can all be f- kind of forced by n- not some power, but by the real, by the fact of reality, by the fact of the thing, to defer to one interpretation, and that interpretation is the best understanding that we have of the data that are out there that um, we've checked with rigorous methods. And it's not like we don't know nothing. <laughs> it's not like these methods are just instruments of power. They do things like send people to the moon and make our cell phones work. Um, and they do reliably work. So rather than than have everybody lean into, let's have one perspective that we try as best we can to agree upon and defer to that as much as possible. The objective here seems to be to lean away from that and into, no, no, let's encourage perspective 
as a matter of thing. And so let me use an example of somebody I hate now using perspective and maybe you'll understand better. And somehow like the elevation of more perspective is supposed to beat the fact that some people are using perspective. It's really just such an odd mentality, but of course also don't say the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As if it wasn't the same Mm. end. Okay. So, so now it's like they change perspective. So where I, I, I am an advocate for epistemic justice, specifically for Mexican American studies, um, and it's about telling our story, and as we experienced it, as we know of our land where before Texas was Mexico, even before that, because there were, this specific region, the borderlands, is a twice colonized hmm. place. We are colonized by the Spaniards and okay. then by the- So before we get into this double colonization complication stuff, where it makes it even harder to get to what the truth might really be because there's stories modified by stories, layered upon stories. Notice the idea that she brought up he who must not be named, uh, also known as the 45th president, um, as an example of somebody doing perspective. And then she talked about how they do perspective. Then she kind of stalled out because there's this weird, almost hypocrisy there. And it's like, uh, but I advocate for this one. So there's this whole mindset within the critical social justice. You see it throughout their literature that, and I mean, throughout their literature, every branch, I even tweeted about it pretty significantly the other day in terms of the engagement on it. uh, Every single thing, they kind of get backwards because they think that they can like open Pandora's box and then control it. Right. (laughs) So they... She brings up he who must not be named, the 45th president, and says, well, when he does perspective, it's obvious he's talking about the same thing. In other words, it's the wrong thing to do. But when I bring up perspective, it's very important. So there's this idea like they can lean into, they can open Pandora's box and lean into postmodern, post-truth things. And then somehow they are the ones who are going to control it. And how are they going to be the ones who control it? Because they're going to use moral bullying basically to say anybody who they don't like that uses these techniques is using them illegitimately only they can use them legitimately and so this is a not only a terrible way to think but it's like horrific to believe that you know you can unleash this thing in the world and then control it so that it can only be used for your purposes and it's kind of the classic thing of they, they these Social justice people are very frequently against free speech. Why? Because they have the agenda to cancel hate speech, you know, to ban hate speech. And okay, I understand your, um, I understand the impulse. I think when I was younger, I argued on behalf of it, but not realizing uh, what I was doing. And so the thing is, when you start to really understand these things is you realize that if you cancel free speech, the people who need free speech most aren't the so-called dominant groups. They're the, <laughs> the, the minoritized or oppressed ones who otherwise don't have the opportunity to make a case. And that case doesn't have to just be their perspective. I'm not arguing for this perspective nonsense. I'm talking about the fact that when you can, you think that you can control how a tool whether it's of repression or whatever, or analytical or whatever, if you think you can control how it's going to be used, especially by political operatives, which you're trying to make everybody into through a personalist political mindset, you're out of your mind. So the the idea that they get to do, well, it's my perspective and it's all about perspective and blah, 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 and there is no truth, it's a matter of, of, of truth, being who who determines what is considered true. So, uh, you know, they're going to push that and then they're going to say, well, I get to use that to forward my ideas, but you can't use that in return because you already have power. Like that's the, the problem is that's a not going to work. And B the second that it does work, you're the one with power now. And whether you can theorize around that or not, most people are going to see it. And all of a sudden you're screwed because they're going to turn it on you. 
So all of a sudden, all you've done is dissolve any ability to get to an objective standard, and you've encouraged uh, the worst actors in society to be able to use tools. And then they say, well, you do it. And I'll, I, as I've tweeted about, as I've commented on, as I've said, I don't know how many times I've said this, I'm virtually certain that if the end of civilization or the end of the world is going to be human caused, um, we will cause it while we scream about hypocrisy. We are so, as a species, so hypersensitive to hypocrisy that we will literally set aside doing anything sensible to call out a hypocrite. And so rather than just saying that somebody's even not caring, but acknowledging somebody's being a hypocrite and just moving on or not even bothering to acknowledge it, we will literally kill ourselves to call people hypocrites. And so the second you start to say, well, we're going to use these tools, but only we can use them because we have the correct application and you don't, you're just setting up the stage for a disaster because you're going to get called a hypocrite and then everybody's just going to call everybody a hypocrite until everybody dies because we're not going to get anything done because we're too busy calling each other hypocrites. Um, Such a disaster. Such a disaster. This is the absolute wrong way to think. And the motivation is like, in a sense, good. It's like, oh, well, I'm going to bring in these tools because they're useful to achieve justice. And you see that in their literature all over the place. You know, you see in a lot of old, like the foundations of queer theory, you see it in like people like uh, Eve Sedgwick and you see it in, in Gail Rubin, them writing things like it would be easier to just accept that gender is has a lot to do with sex biologically and that there are biological underpinnings to it, but it's not as politically useful as using the social constructivist approach. So we have to use the, the more politically useful social, social constructivist approach. So we have to deny reality for pol- So because it's easier to do politics if we do. And it's like, you, you can't actually control that kind of thing. You can't say that you have the right means or sorry, you have the right ends in mind, therefore you can use whatever means because then you just justify those terrible means. It's, it's, a, it's a catastrophe in the making and it's everywhere in their literature that they think they can, oh, let's make critical race theory. One of its core objectives is let's make race much more relevant in everything. Well, that they even acknowledge in their own literature that that's where racism started was people created race specifically to make it relevant so that they could control people. So then we spend 200 years, 400 years, however you want to measure it, uh, from whatever starting point, trying to make that less relevant, have finally made some really good strides on it. And then in the 1990s, they're like, nope, let's make it more relevant again. Because if we make it relevant and only make it relevant in the right ways, then we can minimize... um, you know, existing racism. But the problem is, is you can't control, you can, well, I shouldn't say you can't control who uses it and how is that you can only control that for so long. And we're, we're now getting to the point where that's starting to break down. And that's where the backlash to this can get really scary. So it's like very, like my religious moment is like, forgive them father. They know not what they do. Um, It's what was the phrase that I heard for it? Uh, Roger Scruton had a phrase for it. Um, Un- unscrupulous optimism. Un- that's it. Unscrupulous optimism. Yeah, it's it's very much. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. They think they're doing. They're optimistic in an unscrupulous way. They think that they can just unleash these tools into the world, and then they're just hopeful that it'll just work out. Like nothing bad will happen. There will be absolutely no way this could be turned back on us. Yeah, because they don't care about the procedure. They just care about the outcome. It's like whatever method gets you to the outcome, they see that as the moral principle. Exactly, yeah. It's like I saw a tweet today. Somebody had was talking about how you know we shouldn't be doing something or whatever, whatever it is in education. I could probably find it again real quick. But then the statement was the system isn't perfect yet. And that's why you can't do, you know, like, normal stuff and that's their view is that the system isn't perfect yet and until the system's perfect then they have to maintain control over everything and have it on their terms but the system's never going to be perfect that's why this is perpetual revolution in the making it's the system can't be perfect there is no perfect right all right let's keep going so to stay focused on epistemic justice or this idea of potentially different methods Mm -hmm. there's uh 
what one might say is like the current prevailing scientific method that that may or may not be argued as sort of originating from white people. Is, am I understanding that right? Yeah. And then there's another, can I just finish this one thing? And then I think there, you, you, might, you might argue or other people might argue that there are different methodologies that people will use to come to conclusions besides that one. Mm -hmm. Is it your position that they're on equal footing for bringing us to the truth? Or is one, is one better than the other, more reliable perhaps? I, I take issue with the word truth. Mm. Yeah. Can we get into that? Sure. What definition are yeah, you using for the that. word truth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, the the only possible thing you can do is throw out the idea of truth um, when you start doing this. So, the idea of truth, in the sense that we usually mean it, is sort of, you know, how we can can. I mean, the methods are how we resolve the conflicts of different ideas. But the idea that there is actually this truth out there and that we can know something about it if we apply rigorous methods, in other words, objectivity, is at the heart of how all of this works. And the only thing you can do is say, oh, well, we're thinking about it in all the wrong way by, by thinking about truth at all. So here she says that <laughs> let's just get rid of the idea of truth completely. Um, Let's. I, I take issue with the word truth. I think was their exact words, and um, that's what they had to do to keep pushing. You know this this idea. Uh, so I just come back to Rausch's conflict resolution idea. How are you going to resolve conflicts when person A claims one truth and person B claims another truth, and those are in conflict? How are you going to resolve the conflict? You only have so many methods. One is that you apply a kind of superordinate uh, epistemology, which she's saying doesn't really exist. And one is that you shoot each other. And one is that you segregate and you say, you go over here and have your truth and I'll go over here and have my truth and we'll see how it works out. Um, you don't really have a lot of good options outside of picking if you want people to be able to live together and not have major problems without choosing a superordinate arbiter of what is true and what is false. So you can see the disjunction happening here. Yeah, there, it's just the concern with where authority lies in regards to, you know, solving problems and, you know, these types of things. It's We don't want to put it in the personal because then you can just solve that problem by killing that person or just... We want it. We want a fair system to to deal with here, right? And so the postmodern, or actually, I should say, more generally, critical social justice view is that truth or knowledge is actually a cultural artifact. It's something that cultures produce. It's only something that cultures produce, and they mean that in a radical sense, not in the banal sense. The banal sense, it is true. Statements about reality or about truth or knowledge or whatever they happen to be are sentences and similar constructed in human language to express one idea to one brain from one brain to another brain so that we can understand things in terms of our conceptions about the world, not the world itself. So knowledge is something done in language and uh, the way that we, we decide how the language is used has some influence on knowledge or whatever. And it's set up, you know, and established and kind of policed by authorities that operate within a cultural framework that that's the banal view. That's actually their, their view. The true view, the, the, the deeper view, I should say, that, that's not true is that knowledge doesn't refer to reality, right? Um, we have pretty, it's, it's like I said before, um, when I was talking about the definition of life, it doesn't matter how we describe it. It doesn't matter what we call it. There is something in reality that is occurring, I used to use an example of a proton because I learned this idea by reading something about high energy physics. And um, I don't know what a proton is. You don't know what a proton is. We have lots of physics that describes what a proton is, how a proton behaves. That physics is really, 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 really good at predicting what a proton will do. It's astonishingly good at predicting what a proton will do in various circumstances. However, because 
it is ultimately an object in a model, which is a human construction in language that's constructed out of ideas and therefore is abstract. The phenomenon in reality that we're describing might or might not be a proton, and the ideas we have about what a proton is might not actually be accurate, but nevertheless, that phenomenon really is, and whatever the thing we call a proton, and whatever model it fits in, is very good at producing descriptions of how that thing will behave, right? So there is a phenomenon in reality, and the description we have might be a complete fiction, but it's still really good at doing what it needs to do, which is describing how the thing works. In other words, as I said earlier, about making statements about objective reality upon which we can bet and reliably win. So this idea that there, this postmodern idea that, that truth is inaccessible is on like a very superficial and like I smoked a bunch of weed yesterday level true. I did not smoke a bunch of weed yesterday, by the way, that's not, that was a metaphor. Um, on the next level down though, like what really matters, it's so preposterously false that the way that they use it doesn't make any sense. So this is a very radical interpretation of the idea that truth is just a cultural thing. When I say that they say, when I say critical social justice believes that truth is just an artifact of culture, I mean, really, like they mean it has maybe nothing necessarily at all to do with the reality it attempts to describe, which is just not even wrong. It's overwhelmingly wrong right this relates to like the map versus the territory if right. i wanted to get to disney world i want to use google maps not some random person from the opposite side of the world's imaginations of how to get from a to b we want to match our maps to reality sorry let's keep going yeah and then why are you having issue with it so what's your definition of the word truth well, my definition, I don't think I would use the word true. Like, I don't like using the word normal. Um, I, I really try to operate from a non-binary understanding. Queer theory has entered the building. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very entertainingly. So the fear of normal, by the way, in queer theory is worth elaborating on, especially since I haven't written those entries in the encyclopedia. So the idea... Queer theory exists to disrupt, subvert, dismantle, whatever you want to, whatever of their favorite destructive words you want to use, deconstruct the idea of normal. The idea is that normal, and this is so fucking irritating because it's a <laughs> word game. It is so irritating that the world is being taken over by wordplay. Um, normal means two things, okay? One is descriptive and one is uh, moral. It's actually normative. And <laughs> yes. so normal as a description means like commonplace or usual or whatever. Uh, it's normal for people to have two arms and two legs. And then normal as a thing is it's like, as, as a moral implication is, you know, that dude was just, I don't know what he's doing, but that's abnormal. And, or, you know, that, that view is very abnormal or being queer is abnormal. Therefore, the implication is that it's bad, right? So there's this intentional conflation of something being normal as in common and something being normal as in the way people are supposed to act, normative. And they intentionally live in that conflation and make everything about it. So this person doesn't want to, doesn't want to use the word normal because to use the word normal would imply there's an abnormal. This is very Derrida, by the way. Again, this is postmodernism. So and it's also very Foucault because Foucault was obsessed with the way that madness or uh, insanity was used to discredit abnormal thinkers or political dissidents getting uh, grouped in with that, including homosexuals. So this is why it's so instrumental to queer theory. So both Derrida and uh, Foucault were instrumental in this line of anti-normal thought. Uh, Douglas Murray talked about that where he says that the goal is to actually make homosexuality the, the norm and heterosexuality the, the, the thing that's, that's wrong. This is very mysterious. If MLF alone was being applied to the searches, then a search for straight white couples might turn up some gay couples but it would not end up prioritising images of couples who are neither straight nor white. 
there seems to be a deliberate effort on specific occasions to push images of couples who are none of the things that have been asked for. What appears to be happening is that something is being layered over a certain amount of MLF. It is MLF plus some human agency. And this human agency seems to have decided to stick it to people towards whom the programmers or their company feel angry. This would explain why the searches for black couples or gay couples give you what you want, whereas searches for white couples or straight couples are dominated by their opposites. It explains why people interested in searching for photos of Asian couples do not need to be aggravated or re-educated, whereas the sort of people searching for white couples do. Likewise, straight people of Asian descent do not need to be shown a diversity of mixed-race couples or be told that such couples are not merely normal, but more normal than anything else, or to have photos of gays thrown at them. If a person just wants to search for an Asian couple, they will be shown lots of happy straight Asian couples, young and old. At no point will Google try to rewire their view of what a couple is or what the average relationship might look like. Whereas somewhere in the coding, there has been a very deliberate attempt to upset, throw, disorientate or enrage people who are searching for certain terms. It appears that Google wants to offer the service it prides itself as providing for some people, but not for anyone who might be searching for heteronormative or Caucasian couples. These people would obviously already be a problem and must be refused and frustrated in their attempts to access the type of material they are after. They must be given a giant, tech-sized F.U., all in the interests of fairness, obviously. And that's no joke. He's not wrong in that analysis because queer theory's whole intention is to make it a moral issue that anything that's normal is therefore being upheld by a power dynamic that sees it as normal and therefore needs to be taken apart, destroyed, disrupted, dismantled, subverted, deconstructed. You pick your favorite destructive word. And so from her view, what she's saying there is both of these imply dominant power dynamics. And that's the most relevant thing here. So we need to stay away from those. And because it's a very um, word obsessed or language obsessed way of thinking about the world. If we just stop using words like normal and true, then those think concepts become irrelevant and we can, we can free people from them. In queer theory, they actually have this concept called the, the violence of categorization. And that's a form of apparently violence that's done to somebody when they're put into a category that they don't agree with, <laughs> that makes them, that doesn't fit them or whatever. And uh, that is a very, very powered thing to have, you know, a very power relationship thing to do because that's what the powerful want is they want to put people in categories, normal and abnormal, uh, hetero and a, homo being kind of the relevant queer theory ones or actually hetero and other. Um, so that's the idea here again, though, is this, I, the concept that there's dominance in establishing what is true. There's dominance in establishing what is normal and that dominance is the thing that must be resisted. So anywhere, it doesn't matter if it's correct. It doesn't matter if it's useful. It doesn't matter if it's true anywhere that the dominance is asserting itself that has to be resisted. That's the mindset behind this um, kind of waffling that's happening right now. I mean, it reminds me of 1984, like the whole having a ministry of fixing this language. So it's not much of a problem and it's, it's freaky. There's some, it, it, it's all very strange. It's, it's actually kind of backwards. It's thinking that our language is upstream of reality rather than downstream of reality. Uh, the idea that we could change, if we just change the way we speak about things, we'll change the way we think about things. Again, it's superficially true and minimally true. And in some cases appropriate and applicable, but for the most part, we are describing concepts the best that we can um, and it doesn't, you can't just like magic spell your way around that by changing the words. Yeah. Cool. Let's keep going. Hmm. The majority of people do that. It's a yes or a no. It's a, it's a normal abnormal. Listen to, listen to the language people use. It's all rooted in a binary. And that's the thing. With so Derrida 
in particular is relevant with the binary stuff. Derrida, uh, Jack Derrida, the, he was kind of like postmodern philosopher of language, if you want to use that description. Um, he believed that language appears in these hierarchical pairs that, that encode power. She just literally did the whole Derrida thing. She's like, normal, abnormal. Ah, so one side is good, one side is bad. There's that implication that, you know, they can't just describe things in terms of description. It has to be uh, relative or relevant on the on the normative sense as well. So you have ah, normal, abnormal. So you can even almost sometimes catch it in their voice if they put this like mm-hmm. little stink on 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 one side or the other. And that you have to get away from that. So Der- Derrida actually as far as his philosophy got imported by Judith Butler and Gatry Spivak, whether that's um, accurate to his thought or not, was very concerned with the way that, you know, power is hidden in our use of language and thus conditions us to think in, in ways where power becomes and, maintain, and, and remains relevant. So that's what she's tapping into there. That's direct postmodern philosophy. Yep. It's, strange seeing someone just totally own this philosophy just straight out it's just the whether it's derrida or not what she actually just did was post-structuralist thought as the way that judith butler interpreted it and wow. spivak actually but mostly judith butler all right let's keep going within native and, and indigenous epistemological stand, uh, understandings, mm-hmm. their binaries don't exist. They don't push you into boxes. You are mm. dual. Um, you are a duality. So I don't know if that's true. So I can't speak to that claim one way or the other. I am familiar with the Taoist conceptions, the, the yin yang, if you will. And um, what she said there is if it, if, if it, if it parallels, I mean, it's very possible that she's thinking about the so-called two-spirit people where some people were considered men, some people were considered women, and some people were considered ambiguous and put into a two-spirit category. It's possible that's what she's actually just like expanding to mean everything was not was not dual. Um, but within the, the, the Taoist approach, you have this kind of non-duality thinking, but at the same time, there's still a recognition um, that some things do appear and, and this seems to be an issue of the way people actually probably thought and an exaggeration is more than likely cooked up out of queer theory. So this is like, how do we understand Native American epistemologies through queer theory more than likely uh, than it is? How do we understand Native American epistemologies the way that Native Americans actually understood things? Um, I can't say that definitively because I don't know. And I know that there would be wide variation in Native American epistemologies, and she's probably talking. She mentioned Pueblo earlier, so I'm assuming that she's probably speaking from that position or in terms of that culture. But I have I have no idea to speak to it directly. I just say that uh, it's more than likely an exaggeration, uh, a queer theoretic reinterpretation of how that was actually thought of. Yeah, hard to say. It just seems. Per- extraordinarily unlikely that um, something as fundamental as, you know, male and female would have gone somehow unrecognized uh, by pretty much any culture, seeing as I think children form stable concepts of this very, very early on um, across cultures. Let me understand. So I I carry this box of candies around when this idea of truth comes up Mm -hmm. and some people do view it as binary and some people view it as something else. Mm -hmm. And my question to you is, would a Native American or anyone else, would you perhaps even look at this box of candies and say that it can both be even an odd number of total pieces simultaneously? Well... How would you go about solving that question, whether the total number of pieces in this box is either even or odd? Would you agree that it's one or the other? I No, I wouldn't. Because, again, you're operating from different understandings. You can count them, we can count them as we know numbers to exist Uh in a sequence. We could count those and say there are definitely 35 pieces in there. Okay, great. The in... The Aztecs had the Nepal Wansintzin, which is an entirely different, entirely different understanding of how numbers 
work. So the question becomes, and none of us having access to Aztecs probably can't answer this directly. Actually, I'm just kidding. We can. Could the Aztecs take the candies out of the box and start putting them one on the left, one on the right, one on the left, one on the right, one on the left, one on the right, all the way down till they run out of candies and then determine whether or not they always appear in pairs or if there's one left out without a partner. And the answer is, of course, they could. And that's what the words even and not actually mean. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what to say other than that she's full of shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that there's, there's no getting around it there. The words even and odd are descriptive terms for those two possible states of the world, which do not overlap in, uh, for my nitpicking quantum mechanics people out there, that do not overlap in ordinary macroscopic states of the world. Yeah, tic tac size objects. Yeah. So the thing is, whatever their mathematics was, whatever their mathematics was, in Aztec, in whatever culture, it doesn't matter. The, it's either the case that they could take the candies and divide them equally among two people who were present, or there would be one left over when they tried to. That's there's no other possible option. And so it doesn't matter what mathematical system you're using to try to describe the thing. The state of affairs, independent of that mathematical system, is still either that there are an even number or an odd number of candies in that box. And so her, this is, this is the most full of shit that I've seen her yet. In fact, I wouldn't say that she was full of shit up until this point, but this is just being full of shit to not be wrong. And it comes back to just appealing to that external reality as the arbiter of disagreement versus narrative or story or culture. All right, let's keep going. Would go, it's almost like too advanced. I don't even get it. You know, Hmm. there's this teacher um, at high school um, who she doesn't just bring in Mexican American studies specifically um, for one lesson plan she operates her entire curriculum based on um maya maya yeah maya um understandings of mathematics to bring this to your definition of the word truth then how would you how would you look at this box of candies it's understandings of experience it's understandings um the experience in question is when we split the candies up between two people, is there one left over or not? That's it. That's it. And so, again, I refer to my previous statement, the maximum amount of being full of shit so that she's not wrong that has occurred in this conversation. That's good. Hopefully, if we get into this situation, either with like critical social justice people or just woo people, we could elaborate. This is what we mean by that. If we, I like that. That's, that's good. Yeah, it's understandings of experiences from perspectives. Like, it's not, is it true that the Europeans conquered this land? Yes. Is it true that... Is it true according to who? Mm. <laughs> so all of a sudden, this is this is one of the things I kind of alluded to this earlier since I had seen this before. This is where all of a sudden the true her her she starts falling back into um appealing to claims of truth, even though she's just said that she thinks that true is a term that you should avoid, just like normal is a term you should avoid. Uh so she actually still thinks in terms of true and false and Is it true that the Europeans conquered this land? Well, (laughs) according to who, right? So that all of a sudden that doesn't apply anymore. So again, it's this is at this point mostly trying to. There's a couple of things actually. This is mostly trying to not be wrong, and secondly, you can see that she's getting away from the simple box of candies thing, where it's very apparent that that's what's going on, and now she's trying to talk about something with a great deal more complexity. Uh, now we're talking about, you know, civilizational the dynamics where one civilization is maybe conquering another civilization, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can see that, the, you know, there's this jump now. Let's stop talking about the simple thing and talk about something vague and complicated because that's where 
all of a sudden I can kind of make more of my point. And then once I've got my point, then we'll go back to saying, no, I don't really use the word true. It's, it, this is a rhetorical strategy to win an argument. This is not actually an argument. They, they came into Mexican territory and uh, completely disregarded a treaty. Yes, those things are true. But that's not the truth that we're taught in school. So you can ask any, you know, anyone who's not into these critical studies, what we know as truth is not true. So again, as I mentioned earlier, you, to, to have engaged it correctly, you have to ask somebody who's, who's involved in the critical studies because everybody else has been brainwashed into believing some different form of history that, that paints a better picture for, for them and the, their dominant group. Um, that's the core mindset of critical social justice. That right there. It's their narrative. Okay, it's narrative. Their narrative. Is your position that a person's narrative, particularly if they're from a, a, a disenfranchised tribe or community of people, that the narrative supersedes truth? Yes. Or is narrative truth? Or is narrative better than truth? So does it supersede it? Narrative is very important to upholding colonial legacies. Narrative is important. We celebrate the Alamo. You can have your rings spend the, your class rings spend the night in the Alamo for some special ceremony because the, the colonial narrative that we have been fed is that Davy Crockett and all of them and the, the whole, you know, Alamo thing. Now, when indigenous students come to town, I don't think that they want their class rings spending a night in this very mm -hmm. colonial structure, but it's okay. important for there's a lot going on right there that we don't have to touch on a lot of it, but the, I like the part there where when indigenous students come to town, let me just tell you what they probably will and won't want. And I just love that part, right? Um, let me just tell you what people who are theorized by the stuff I study are going to think about things. They're not individuals. They belong to this group and you know, it's, it's, it's just a proclivity that they have to do this. And of course, it's all based on very simplistic narratives about, well, what do, what does our education system actually teach? Is it only this, you know, very, uh, whitewashed, if you will, uh, interpretation of history that's very favorable to how great the white people were. And granted, she's in Texas and it's kind of famous that, that Texans have, have <laughs> warped the, uh, K through 12 educational program for that. But I mean, you just don't see that at the university level for sure. You see much more, not only do you see nuance and engagement with other perspectives when the university system is doing what it's supposed to, you see um, it profoundly bent to the critical now for the most part. Uh, of course, the desire to rewrite history is something that everybody who can do it often tries to do. Um, history is a particularly difficult and susceptible subject to narrative. And so you see this kind of like bleeding, taking the critical mindset, sticking it in history, and then letting that bleed out into other things is kind of the, the dynamic that's happening here. I really just wanted to pause here and comment on the fact that she's ready to speak for what she thinks indigenous people who are clearly not individuals because they think like indigenous people um, what what they would want and not want and how they would think about these different things. It's the tendency to want to speak for people as groups with critical theories being critical social justice theories in particular being the, considered the only authoritative way to speak uh, uh, about that stuff. That's sort of the problem that she's showing there. It seems like a way to reinforce a super hard stereotype. Like every identity has the stereotype of their beliefs and values. And if I come across anyone of that group, I should, I should think they believe that or value certain things. That's correct. Um, it really, it, it ultimately comes down to that. And it's again, I mentioned that standpoint epistemology idea earlier. The idea where that comes from is that not only do they have their different, say, knowledge traditions, if you want to talk about, say, Native American epistemologies, but they also should have their own authentic experience. They, they should have their ex the experience of being oppressed according to being a member of that group. And so the experience of oppression 
as a member of that group has been theorized. And thus there is the so-called authentic way to have that experience and speak about that experience, which is what critical theory would say. And then there's the inauthentic way. So she hasn't done it here. She just says, um, I don't think native Americans who come to town or indigenous people who come to town would want to participate in that ritual. Uh, but the general next step with that, if, if Anthony had pushed the question, for example, and said, well, what if some came to town and they did want to do that? What if they did want to participate in that? If they wanted to participate in that, that culture instead, she would say that that, or I don't know what she would say, but the, the theory would say that that's an inauthentic expression of their experience um, and it may even go so far as to say that they've internalized colonialism or something like that. So that the, the, the point there is that not only are these, this theory come up with these very, very stereotypical ways of thinking about how oppression exists and is experienced by people and therefore how people are, but it also thinks that anybody who breaks out of that mold has been brainwashed by the dominant forces in society. Uh, to think something that they shouldn't. And so they're not actually being authentic and thus their opinions can be discounted or ignored. Um, it's really pretty sick. But the point there is that theory can't be disagreed with. Um, theory is always right because yes. theory says it's right. Super unfalsifiable, not good. With regards to this idea of a narrative and then truth, rather than getting hung up on specific examples, I. I if it's okay, I'd like to keep it really simple. If there was a narrative, if there was a an Indian narrative that says, whenever you happen to approach a man with a box of candies, the total number of pieces will always be even. If I know it's a silly narrative. If there was a narrative like that, would it mean that it was factually true that whenever you approached a person, a man, and he had a box of candies, the total number of pieces would be even. Would it make it factually true because of the narrative? But I don't, I don't like truth. It, it would, it would depend on what epistemological standpoint you're coming from. <laughs> if and that's we, where we have never, ever, ever have found um, common ground. You know, when, hmm. when Montezuma's men were approached by whatever uh, Hernan Cortez when he hands Montezuma's men a Bible and Montezuma feels he's king like what is this this means nothing to me and Hernan Cortez is like oh my god it's the holy bible he disregarded because he didn't understand the meaning of in which the bible meant to him just as mm. Hernan Cortez didn't understand the meaning of coming to a king and handing him a book. Okay, that's a good example. So let's say, yeah, we have two competing holy books, or let's say we even have two competing narratives. They are, they're competing epistemologies. Yes. So if we had a competing epistemology for the total number of pieces in this container, and there's a narrative that says whenever you encounter a man and he's holding a box of candies, mm -hmm. the total number of pieces will be even. And then there's a competing narrative that says the total number of pieces will be odd. How do we resolve the... Do you even see that as a conflict? Would one of the tribes be correct and one of the tribes be incorrect? Mm, I don't know, because there's, there's many different nations, you know? Like, it's not... Which, one, which narrative should win the day? I don't know if either one should win. They both win. You know, they're both systems of understanding. Would they both be factually true in reality it about the situation? Third, so... What's about to drop is a big one, but we'll pause for a second because there's a lot going on there. Um, Anthony's trying really hard to try to bring her back to a conflict resolution system, which is let's just count the damn things and then we'll go with whatever's there. And she's trying really hard to resist going there because she wants the narrative, whatever the she wants to be able to say that cultural truth or cultural knowledge is the best you can do. So he even actually asked, how would you resolve this uh, conflict? And she dodged the question because there is no way to, to resolve the conflict unless you agree that you can reach to something that's either superordinate or to something that is uh, objective. And you can't have just 
all the different narratives out there and then resolve conflicts that come up unless you have one or the other of those things. What is not being admitted here, but is it core to critical social justice is that it does offer, it doesn't just say we're going to have a bunch of narratives like she's saying. It does not say that. It says that there is a conflict resolution system and that conflict resolution system isn't count the pieces. It's whoever's group had the most oppression, which you're going to now fight about for a long time. And it's a very divisive process, but whatever group has had the most oppression, that group's narrative gets the most attention. And so it's very, very important to realize that what we're talking about are conflict management systems where you come up with two conflicting perspectives or narratives or whatever it happens to be epistemologies even yes uh when they come to different conclusions how do you manage that conflict and the game that critical social justice often plays is to say that a very kind of postmodern and culturally relativist old claim that we're just going to let all of the things be true at once and there's no such thing as truth and da, 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 which is already horrifying as it is but the reality is that they've already built in the, the thing is called intersectionality. As a matter of fact, they've already built in a mechanism by which they're going to adjudicate those conflicts. And the way that they're going to do it is by appealing to who, according to critical theory, has been the most oppressed, which itself is going to be, wh- why do you see these people infighting so much? Why do you see them chewing at each other's ankles so often? Why is it that you see battles between indigenous people and settlers of color? Why do you see the, the people of color is not sufficient? Now you have to have black and indigenous people of color. Why do you have within just black people, do you have people saying, well, there's light skin privilege and medium skin privilege, and those are hierarchically more than dark skin oppression. And because there's this race to, it's called competitive victimhood in the sociological literature. There's this race to claim as much of an oppressed status as possible because that is the conflict resolution system under intersectionality, under this radically egalitarian, if we want to use Jonathan Rausch's approach, um, there's phrasing means of, of trying to settle conflict. And it's not a very good one because you'll notice that reality just got left right out and it just becomes yeah. a, a matter of uh, people fighting for st- the ability to claim that they are the most oppressed because in that situation, they actually have the most power. Um, it's kind of like upside down power grabbing in a sense. Yeah. We're not going to appeal to the most oppressed epidemiologists to solve this crisis of, you know, and, or the most oppressed people who can make the best vaccines. They would. Really? Oh yeah, definitely. They would. And we, we will see things along those lines, uh, if they're not already out there, I'd be shocked where it starts talking about how nobody's paying attention to traditional medicines and how traditional cultures have different ways of probably even hand washing and avoiding viruses or dealing with viruses when they come up and nobody's paying any attention to those. And all the rush for trying to find a vaccine is just forwarding whiteness, all that kind of stuff. Wait until they start trying to apply the vaccine to some country where most of the people aren't white and see what happens, see what they say. Like if we had magically two vaccines that worked, but one was made by a person of color and one was made by a white person, they would say we should p- take the person of color version? Yes, absolutely. Not necessarily because it works better or doesn't work better, but because it would be creating justice alongside administering a vaccine. They will absolutely say that. Wow. The source matters always. But if the white vaccine is produced and then they try to give it to Africa, you just wait. It's colon- <laughs> It'll be colonialism to try to inject people with that vaccine. Literal colonialism of their bodies with whiteness. Somebody will make that argument. I'm not saying it'll mainstream. I'm just saying somebody will make that argument. It'll be somebody serious uh, and it'll probably get published in some shockingly significant journalistic outlet. That's terrifying. Jeez. It would be up to the whoever wants to stand as the authenticator of facts. It mm. would be for that person to decide. Okay, so that right there is like the most important sentence that she says in the pair of videos. So let's, let's try to back. actually just go back and get her to say the whole thing clearly. I don't know if either one should win. They both win. You know, they're both systems of understanding. Would they both be factually true in reality? 
about the situation. It would be up to the whoever wants to stand as the authenticator of facts. It would mm. be for that person to decide. That's straight, straight, straight Foucault. I don't know if this young woman's ever read Foucault. Maybe she has, maybe she hasn't. That is straight Foucault. That what is true is determined by what what we call true is a determination made by people who have power and decide what it is we'll call true and not true. Anything too far outside of that's going to be called crazy. So that's where you see Foucault talking. It, Foucault talks about that kind of stuff in um, History of Madness. Uh, so that is a straight Foucauldian idea that that which we consider true is only true because the people who authenticate facts have agreed that it's true. And those decisions were ultimately political in nature. And they, because of the nature of the way the critical theory mindset works, those determinations were made in a way that maintains dominance and power for the people who have dominance and power, because those things are always self-justifying. And it's really shocking to hear, you know, a uh, probably around 20 year old woman to guess. So somebody who's born around the year 2000, just blatantly saying Foucault's concept of power knowledge, that power and knowledge aren't just related to one another, but they are in fact exactly the same thing. They're a single concept that has to be thought of as, a, as, as one concept. It's, it's kind of shocking to just hear that and that be her justification for why we can't determine if there are an even or odd number of candies in a box, which is not a controversial position by any stretch. I mean, the axioms of mathematics are, for the most part, the basic axioms of mathematics that would let us count candies in a box are not controversial statements in almost any respect. And so the fact that she's willing to say that it all comes down to who authenticates the facts as to what is and is not true is the single most postmodern thing that she said, but it's actually indicative of the critical social justice mindset. That is how they think about truth and facts, is that it's not whether something is actually true or not, which Anthony's trying to really, like, I think he's a bit confused, um, if I had to guess. It's that they really do see the authentication of facts as purely political objects. And in particular ones that are used to maintain people's social and political advantage when they've already got it. Um, there's no objectivity. It's all politics, even under knowledge. So it's really, what's incredible though, like I said, is that this young person is articulating that so clearly um, it's, beyond any question that it's it's deep at the heart of how they think about things that it, the question if you read like in robin d'angelo some of her books she doesn't say she says that anytime you encounter something like facts you have to ask well who does it benefit for that to be considered a fact <laughs> or if there's an epistemological method you can't evaluate that epistemological method without saying well who does it benefit um and that is how they think about everything. It's what is the cynical politic play behind everything, even counting the number of candies in a box? What's the cynical politics behind the method that would let us determine whether it's an even number or an odd number in that box? What would you recommend Anthony say next to like, like to get people to reflect on how dangerous and how just crazy this is? That is a hard question. Um, because if you think about the nature of this particular mindset, it's like it's it's very much a what can you do with it. Um, the best that I, I mean, I'm not great at street epistemology, so I'm kind mm -hmm. of guessing the best that I would recommend is to um, have him try to figure out if she lives her life that way and. Uh, you know, a day-to-day -day fashion. I know he's actually got a trick where he like steals something of theirs <laughs> and then won't give it back um, and say, well, this is my narrative and that's your narrative who wins. So that might actually be a pretty good trick right here. You know, I'm really thirsty right now. 
And you're actually holding my water bottle. <laughs> yeah. That's true for me. Okay. Does that it make, makes you happy. Does it make Just, it? Does you it stole my water bottle, so. <laughs> I hey, stole it? That, I mean, it. that is, took it from, it wasn't yours, it was mine. But that's if, like. If it was true for me true. that it was actually mine. Would it make it well, true? You're just probably just a little. That would make you maybe a little off. <laughs> <laughs> um, my narrative is that this is mine, and your narrative is that it's yours. And what do you say? And then reveal that she does not actually live her life according to that principle. But um, it's very hard because she could easily just turn around and say, "Well, I'm a smaller young woman of minority or." race of some type and you are a bigger stronger cis man who uh, is white and so you have all the dominance right now so um clearly you're just going to be able to assert your narrative all of a sudden and that's what you did to me and boohoo you know victim narrative etc etc uh so th this is what i said it's so difficult because this is actually everybody thinks that this stuff's just insane but it's not it's actually very internally consistent and it's very difficult to get people to shake out of it because if you see power dynamics everywhere Everything that you try is just an application of power dynamics. She could even just bail out if he asks the right question, whatever it happens to be, and say, well, you challenging me on this is actually you just asserting your power over me or asserting the dominant narrative over me or the dominant epistemological method that follows from trying to get to a right answer or to agreement or to, to conciliation or to whatever it is. It's, it's really a poisonous set of ways to think. Yeah, she does a, that exact same thing in the next video where something happens and she accuses Anthony of, of you know, his white privilege and his, uh, you know, dominant, you know, standpoint. It's very interesting. Want to finish out this video? Is it conceivable that a representative of each tribe could sit down and count the total number of pieces to see which narrative corresponds with reality? They they have different realities. They have di they come from different. What? Um, that's the thing, right? So the narrative creates a reality. Where I said earlier that they have it backwards, and they believe that the language creates a reality, um, or rather, the experience of reality is really what is relevant here. I mean, depending on how sophisticated they are, they don't. She says they have different realities. Um, Richard Rorty was a little bit more careful. He actually said that as an American postmodern philosopher. Um, he actually said that reality is out there, but we can't know it. So uh, it would be the experience of reality that people have that's different if you want to make her position a little stronger. But the belief here is really that they have different realities. So the number of candies would, uh, the me, the, the ex I don't even know how to phrase it because it's just nonsense. It's, it's actually incorrect. So it's very difficult to try to explain what it is. But she, I mean, I can't even deal with they have different realities. They they, they, they don't have different realities. The number it's, it's such a simple example that there's nothing to do with it. There is the number of candies and there's what they call like numbers of candies that pair off and numbers of candies that can't. And it's very instructive to see that th this level of commitment to the idea. Although, like I said, she probably doesn't live her life that way. <sighs> they have different narratives. Yet, if we sat them down, they would probably count the total number of pieces the same, I would think. It depends on how they're conceptualizing what equals one. Mm -hmm. Does, does mm -hmm. this piece equal one, two, three, four? Right. Is this one right. because it's a whole? They might bind them together as twins. And that All right. It's a bit of a stretch, right? It depends on what they mean by one. Well, what do you say there is, is what if they spend a little bit of time and agreed that what obviously looks like a single piece constitutes one, and then they counted the number of those. And it actually, at this point, wouldn't matter what the unit that they choose is um, because they can just start counting off of that unit, uh, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. But the idea, again, with something like candies, that it's not clear what one is, is just 
philosophical nonsense. It's just lawyering words to try to make sure that you don't have to back away from a position that's that, that can't be held. Yeah, just pure rationalization. And that's one piece. But we could even maybe look at it a different way. Which pieces block the same amount of light if we were to shine a light behind it or if we were to put them onto a scale or something? We could probably come up with some standard with which to compare the narratives to see which one reflects the reality of the situation. Well, we have come up with that, and it's called the numbers as we know them today. Mm. Mm. So my best friend has French toast waiting for me, so I'll be looking for segment three. Would, would you like your second segment? Yes. Okay. And just so you know, I don't want you to feel obligated to be coming back for these. <laughs> just so you know, but uh, I really enjoyed the talk. collection. <laughs> okay. Right, Take it easy. Bye-bye. All right. Now very, you know, aware of your time. I've had you for, I think, about two hours. Um, maybe we can, uh, if you feel like it, we can do the another, this is a whole another 20 minute video, but it's, I'm sure it, this is taking too much of your time already. But this, I'm very appreciative of it. I mean, maybe we can come back to the, the, the third one at, at another, another point. Um, but I mean, this is just, you know, staggering, right? Uh, so her her conclusion was that we have come up with it and it's the numbers as we know them today. It's very difficult to ascertain what she's saying with that, given the content of everything that she said before it. And I mean, again, I don't, it's, I don't want this to come off like I'm picking on her. Uh, it's actually the mindset that she's taken on that I'm interested in criticizing. And the the shocking inconsistencies that come along with trying to defend it in its like kind of most fervent expression against the most simple examples. So <clears throat> she has to conclude then apparently that the numbers that we use today are somehow the correct standard after she she'd said that there there was no correct standard and that the numbers that we use today are just the dominant myth. So it's like what do you do with that? I don't know what you do with that, but I know what you don't do with it. It is kind of a, I guess we can call it a closing thought is that you, you don't take its good in its, its claimed good intentions and use that to bamboozle you into thinking that it needs to be turned into something like policy just because somebody has, you know, what seems like the right intentions or that they're on the right side of, of, the morals of an argument in some broad sense doesn't mean that you have to import this, like something that, that clearly can't even deal with itself. While the argument is very consistent, she actually can't apply that argument to reality because it's utterly abstract and does not actually comport well with reality. When you start getting into that nitty gritty, I have to say that Anthony's pretty genius for bringing the candies into that um, because it's like she was sailing pretty good on her whole, you know, Alamo and Hernan Cortez and all of the different, you know, sociological and anthropological features, which are vague and complex and have different different aspects to them. And it's impossible to tell a deep and long and complex historical story. Like every version of history is a compression, right? We have yeah. think of the details of your every single day, just you by yourself interacting with nobody. Think of the level of detail that there is. Even if you were to say, well, I made a cup of coffee. That's if you actually told that in full detail of like, I did this, then I got this, then I got a spoon, then I did this, then I did that. It's an insane amount of, of detail. Now, now, take that to something like an army taking over something the size of Texas. It's just insane how much detail has to get left out of a historical narrative to, to tell the story. So you can, she does pretty good when she gets into that. But as soon as it becomes something really simple, it just shows that th this works really well when you can kind of wave your hand and be abstract and vague. As long as you don't have to nail down to anything simple and clear, you can maintain it. But the second you have to be simple and clear and actually say what you mean, the, it's not even <laughs> that, she, that the ship just crashed into the rock and broke into pieces. It's not even that. It looped back around and came right back to to the place where we all knew it would end up, which is our numbers aren't nonsense. This isn't all just an abstract game. And if we're actually pinned to reality, we're going to start agreeing on things. Um, so it's like, it's, you can't even maintain it because it's just something that can live in out in, in abstract space. And that's, that's just not sufficient for the kinds of things that we would, would want to do with a theory that purports to be able to reorganize society. 
Cool. Well, thanks again, James. The the next video is basically all more, more of the same, more of the same stuff. And uh, I wanted to yeah, just recommend everybody check out newdiscourses.com. Check out his encyclopedia. You update it pretty much every day almost. And it's really yeah, great. we try to get at least one thing up on new discourses every day if we can. Um, sometimes it's two or three. I try to add I'm work. I mean, I've gotten behind in the last few days. The virus is throwing everything off. I'm trying to make it so that I add one to two new entries to the encyclopedia on average every day until I can get through all of them. My real goal was to finish more or less finish the thing until I've run into new terms I don't know about by the end of the year. But um, given everything else I'm trying to keep up with, I don't think that's going to be realistic anymore. Uh, it's a monumental project to do an encyclopedia by yourself. <laughs> Yeah, well, I appreciate it. You're doing great work and it helps me, helps everybody learn about this mindset. It's just really great. Yeah, good. Share the encyclopedia with people. Every time you see these terms, if you want to know what what you can do to help is like every time you see these terms come up in a debate or whatever discussion or whatever online, you see something like this video. I know, Reed, you did this with with the videos when Anthony put them out that you went and commented with a bunch of the timestamps and links to the encyclopedia. Do that. Just you do that. Anybody else watching this, put those links everywhere get get the information out there so that more and more people can can see what is really being meant when these terms are coming up and how the because the, the encyclopedia tells about the terms but it also tells shows how they think how the terms interrelate with one another and you if you float around in there i don't know you can tell me if you i have a hypothesis and you can tell me if i'm full of it or not and if i'm full of it just please let me know but uh, if you read about 10 of those, and, and I don't mean you just like skim down the master list and pick 10, but maybe even then. But if you read one and then you pick some of the like, oh, well, this concept and, you know, seems really important. You're reading one of them and there's all those hyperlinks. And you say this concept seems really important. So you click on that one and you read a second one and you're like, well, this concept in here seems really important. And you click on that one and you're like, oh, well, that seems interesting. You click on that and you go through five to 10 of those. I actually have a hypothesis that reading five to 10 of those where you just kind of naturally surf through um, leads one toward the, the understanding of how systematic these ideas are and how they interlock with one another and uh, rest on one another. And that it's actually a mindset and not just a few weird words. I don't know if you've had that experience since you've read some of it. Yeah. Hard to say with me, but yeah, I think, most people would pick up the patterns once you start going through it all. Uh, yeah, I think it's really good though. Okay, great, great. So yeah, share the share the links, put them yeah. everywhere. Help people understand what what this thing is, and yeah. that that helps a lot. Awesome. Well, thanks again, James. I hope to talk to you again sometime. Maybe we could talk about something else, explain some more things. This is great. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it. All right, perfect. Thanks.